Before we get started, just a reminder that given an executive order that Governor uh, Baker issued that gave some relief to the open meeting law, we are able to conduct this meeting using remote connectivity. So we've been doing that since March and, and, and uh, successfully. But should something go wrong, please go to the MGC website and we'll give additional direction in the event that we have to reconnect. So thank you everyone and we'll get started um, calling to order today public meeting 316. It's August 27th at 10.02 a.m. And we'll get started with item number two on the agenda, the approval of minutes. Commissioner Stebbins. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, my colleagues in your packet, you have the uh, meeting minutes from the June 25th, 2020 meeting. Uh, it was obviously a lengthy session of minutes uh, as we reviewed community mitigation fund applications. Uh, but I would move their approval subject to any correction or any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Are there any edits, questions for um, I, Let's I go ahead. Um, at 12, the entry at 12.16 p.m., where we were talking about the Springfield Police Department request, um, it comments that I've referenced the Las Vegas shooting which I did. Um, but the broader discussion that's then referenced, I, before I said that, I said that I agreed with uh, Commissioner Zuniga's comment about the riot shields and asked for broader discussion in that regard, not just about the shooting. So if we could insert a sentence at that point that says, Commissioner O'Brien reiterated Commissioner Zigo's concern about the riot shields and asked there'd be a broader discussion. Okay. Any further comments or edits on the uh, minutes? Okay, hearing none, I just wanna thank Shara, they, they were extensive. Uh, thank you very much, Thorough. Um, I second that motion. Thank you. Okay. And we'll have a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. Aye vote. Yes, five zero. Shara, thank you very much. Okay, moving on to item number three. I want to begin today's meeting by acknowledging that this week marks six weeks since our licensee has been committed to reopen under phase three of the Commonwealth's phased reopening. On behalf of my fellow commissioners, I want to thank our team at the MGC and our colleagues at Encore Boston Harbor MGC and Springfield and Plainridge Park Casino for their tireless work under these unprecedented circumstances. I know that we are united in purpose to ensure a safe gaming environment for all patrons and employees. The reopening measures developed and executed by licensees in close collaboration with the MGC have been thoughtful and comprehensive, including reduced capacity, temperature checks at entry, and plexiglass installation on the gaming floor. My fellow commissioners and I recognize and appreciate the level of investment that has been made to date to create as safe an environment as possible under the current conditions. That said, in light of recent events at Encore Boston Harbor, I wish to remind all that the MGC's jurisdiction and regulatory responsibilities extend to the entire gaming establishment beyond the gaming floor. It's imperative that we take all necessary steps to enforce social distancing and all other COVID-19 related measures as outlined in the reopening safety guidelines approved by the Gaming Commission. To put it plainly, the stakes are too high for anything but full compliance with those safety standards. I am pleased that our colleagues at Encore Boston Harbor have taken the recent events very seriously and have taken action to address these issues. I commend the MGC staff for its swift assessment of the situation, which we continue to monitor. 
we will hear more about the specifics concerning Encore Boston Harbor during Interim Executive Director Wells' upcoming administrative report. But once again, I want to remind us all of how critically important it is that we remain vigilant in our efforts. Moving on now to item number four on the agenda. Interim Executive Director Wells, if you could go uh, forward with your administrative report. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, and good morning uh, to the commissioners. Uh, as a, uh, for item A on the uh, administrative update, uh, as, um, some good news. I would like to announce formally and publicly that the MGC has named Todd Grossman as the general counsel for the commission. Uh, I'm really pleased personally. I've known Todd not only throughout my time here at the commission, but while I was uh, at EOPS as the undersecretary of law enforcement, he was the deputy general counsel at uh, the Department of Public Safety. So we worked together there. Uh, Todd has served in the uh, role as the interim general counsel since the end of 2019. And I'd like to commend him for his work during really difficult times. It was not easy during uh, the shutdown, during the pandemic. Uh, they were down people in the legal department and he rose to the occasion. I think everyone can acknowledge that one of uh, Todd's greatest strengths is, is his level-headedness and his ability to remain calm during a crisis. And that was uh, seriously noted during this time. It was, it was very welcomed by not only me, by the staff and the commissioners. So that was really helpful. Uh, so I want to thank you for that, Todd. Uh, as I stated, Todd um, you know, was the interim general counsel since the end of 2019. And uh, prior to that, he served as a Deputy General Counsel for the Commission from November of 2012 through the end of 2019. Uh, before that, as I mentioned, he had been the Deputy General Counsel of the Department of Public Safety from 2006 till 2012. He had served uh, in uh, capacity as a private attorney briefly in 2005 and 2006. And prior to that, uh, he also served as an Assistant District Attorney from 2000 to 2004 at the Middlesex District Attorney's Office, which a number of us here at the Commission also had the good fortune uh, to be part of that office. Uh, so I want to thank Todd, uh, welcome you, and I just want to you know, say that we all appreciate all the work you've been doing and we all look forward to working with you in the future. So I don't know if you want to say hello or thank you, but just check in. Yeah, I would love to, uh, if I may. Thank you, Karen, for those kind words. Uh, Usually that kind of praise only comes from my parents and my wife. So I appreciate, uh, I appreciate that, those sentiments. Uh, certainly one of the great honors of my career to be invited to step into this role um, in this environment and particularly here in this organization uh, that is really so full of smart, thoughtful, conscientious and aware people really across the org chart. Um, so sincerely, thank you. Um, and uh, we're ready to get right down to it. So here we go. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, any, any commissioners want to we'll weigh in or otherwise I will jump right into my uh, next item on the casino reopening update. Seems just like this is a good chance. Um, why don't we start with Commissioner Cameron? Yeah, just a, a, just a, uh, a quick thank you and congratulations to General Counsel Grossman. Haven't called him that yet. So happy to, happy to use the title and um, Look forward to uh, our continued uh, working together. You've served us well, and I expect you'll do the same in the future. So, thank congrats, you, Commissioner. Thank you. Appreciate that, Commissioner Seneca. Thank you. Just the same. Thank you for all the work uh, that that you've done. Uh, I think uh, that was a testament. Uh, um, you know, all the, the years that you've been with us, uh, how much you've understood the industry and, and helped us develop um, all the regulations in a thoughtful way and many other things navigating through um, complicated lawsuits, uh, a lot of legal uh, questions. You down a couple of people in that department and that adds to the level of complexity that Karen has uh, mentioned already in terms of um, operating in this remote environment. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, you're doing a great job and look forward to um, your continued involvement and, and a rebuilding of that department as well because the, the lawsuits haven't slowed, the challenges haven't slowed in this um, um, pandemic, uh, but uh, we continue to navigate them uh, with your aid. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Commissioner Stebbins. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a, just a, a note of congratulations to Todd. He started out with us way back uh, when we were over on State Street in Boston, uh, but he's been uh, such an important part of the team in so many different respects. Uh, I can't find anybody who gets more excited about regulations than Todd, so it's, <laughs> it's great to have him on the team, and uh, uh, I know he's got a lot on his plate as he moves forward, but uh, uh, just to offer my congrats. Thank you, Commissioner. We got lots of regulations to talk about today, so that'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a good day. It's a good day. Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, I'll make it short and sweet. I've, I've had the opportunity to already congratulate Todd in a smaller setting. Um, so in the interest of time, I won't go into depth other than to say, um, I think everything Karen said about, you know, particularly your temperament and your ability to handle the last, the crisis and sort of the lack of um, personnel and then the, the environment and the virtuality uh, is been tremendously helpful for the group. So again, I wish you luck and, and congratulations again. Thank you, Commissioner. It's a pleasure. I appreciate it. And um, just to close, congratulations, General Counsel. Um, you you and, um, went through a thorough uh, competitive assessment. That's because that was the right thing to do. It did not surprise those of us involved in that, that you would emerge at the top. But uh, we thank everyone for the support they've given the lean legal team during this time, but most of all for your leadership during this time, Todd, I know your team has appreciated it very much. And we look forward to working with you going forward in this new and exciting role. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. I'm looking forward as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so moving on to item B in the administrative update is the casino reopening update. Uh, so uh, the casinos are still operating, obviously, under the COVID guidelines. And while uh, general compliance is still occurring, um, it, as we are aware uh, through media reports, the, uh, there was an incident at uh, Encore Boston Harbor, which I'd like to just update you on, um, near the early morning hours of Sunday, August 16th. Um, GE responded to a guest suite at the uh, hotel following a report from the Encore Boston Harbor Security Department on a disturbance. Uh, in some, there were over 110 individuals inside the suite where the GEU officers entered. And pursuant to the hotel's own rules, the suite capacity is limited to 10 people. Um, the investigation identified uh, a male uh, who had rented the suite on the late afternoon of August 15th. Uh, the hotel had issued three key cards for the room. Uh, after checking in, uh, that individual and a male companion proceeded to the elevator lobby, escorted other individuals back to the suite in small groups. This occurred frequently from the first and second floor elevators starting at approximately 6.30 p.m. Review of the surveillance footage, uh, the queuing at the elevators showed at some relevant periods over the course of the evening, the six-foot social distancing requirement was not met. Uh, the investigation uh, into the incident showed that approximately uh, midnight, a member of Encore Boston's Harbor's hotel management team received a call from an unidentifiable number stating that the caller was viewing the Instagram account of one of the individuals who rented the suite and saw that he had at least 100 people in the suite at Encore Boston Harbor. Uh, approximately 15 minutes later, at around 12.15, an Encore Boston Harbor butler made a report to EDH personnel at the hotel's front desk. He had just delivered an item to the suite and saw more than 30 people inside and informed them to clear out the party for violating the maximum hotel occupancy. At around 12.30, uh, hotel management called the suite and informed the individual of the max maximum occupancy and of noise complaints and to clear out the suite within 15 minutes. Surveillance video also, also showed that 36 individuals departed the suite at that time. At around 12.37, a caller with an unidentifiable number, unidentifiable number told EBH Hotel Management they were going to call the Board of Health for the occupancy violation. At approximately 3 a.m., EBH security uh, and officers of the GE responded to the street for a reported disturbance. And at that time, as mentioned before, uh, over 110 individuals were present in the suite. Um, the majority of them were not wearing masks. So that generally gives you a summary. Uh, the IEB does note uh, that the guest that registered uh, the suite has been charged with disorderly conduct for hosting the gathering and was issued a $500 citation for violating the governor's order prohibiting gatherings of over 25 people. Um, so 
as part of uh, our duties, you know, in, in the enforcement arm of the commission, the gaming agents, uh, and with some assistance from the state police, uh, conducted this investigation, and they did it swiftly. As, as the chair mentioned, we did take swift action uh, pursuant um, to Ma Mass Journal Laws Chapter 23K, Section 36A, as a first step required by law. We did issue a notice of noncompliance to the casino and uh, gave them uh, some identifiable measures and some time for correction. Those measures included developing and implementing a communications plan to inform and in, uh, to emphasize to hotel guests of these capacity that uh, which are lower than the 25 person limit set by the governors that that be strictly enforced and that the communications plan should also inform and emphasize to hotel guests the strict prohibition on indoor gatherings uh, and the $500 penalty. We also require they develop and implement a training plan for employees to identify red flags and escalate, escalate them immediately to supervision, the security department, and the GEU as appropriate, including unusually frequent entries and exits to a hotel room or suite and any information tending to evidence prohibited indoor gathering. I, I do note, I think the only time the, uh, the, at the time the security department was not made aware of this, uh, these red flags until 3 a.m. when they cleared out the entire room. Uh, we did require increased uh, security staff monitoring of the elevator lobbies of the first and second floors to ensure that only registered guests gain access to hotel rooms and suites and that the six foot distancing requirement is met and that there's compliance with the mask requirement. And finally, assign security staff to monitor hotel floors to ensure prompt response to unusual noise, activity, and disturbances. And we require uh, that the uh, facility report back to the IEB in writing the next day, uh, that would be Friday, August 21st, on the specific details of the steps it was taking to address this important matter. So I'd like to commend uh, the gaming agency, the state police, and uh, Attorney Lilios, who spearheaded this, and she actually issued the notice of noncompliance. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to her uh, to give you sort of uh, an overview of their response to the issuance of the notice of noncompliance, and then turn it over to Assistant Director Bruce Band uh, to talk about subsequent activity to, at the casino and what it's been like since this happened and, and what they're seeing at the casino. Uh, does anyone have any questions for me at this time, or should I just turn it over to Attorney Lilios? If we're good. Okay, so Loretta, are you there? You can. Uh, yes, I am. Good morning, uh, Karen. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, uh, so, as Karen mentioned, the notice that we issued last Thursday uh, required uh, the property to take immediate uh, steps, and as of last Thursday, the property already had uh, implemented uh, many steps. Uh, the property did report to us in writing on Friday on the steps that it was undertaking to comply with our requirements. And uh, they had added a number of measures that they had identified uh, would be helpful uh, to identifying uh, any guests uh, that might be intending to have a prohibited gathering uh, and some of their efforts have uh, borne fruit. I know Bruce can update you uh, on some of our monitoring uh, efforts. Um, specifically, the detailed measures that Encore uh, provided uh, uh, included the strictly enforcing their own limits on occupancy, which are less than the governor's uh, limits. So their limits are four to a room and 10 to a suite. Their communication plan has included written and oral uh, explanation and um, uh, discussion with guests upon check-in of the limits and of uh, fines uh, over and above the civil citation uh, that the Commonwealth um, allows for. They have it, um, uh, will be issuing their own fines for violations of their uh, occupancy limits. And those communications in and of themselves have led to a number of immediate cancellations 
uh, of uh, guest reservations. Uh, so um, on the front end, it, it seems like you know that that measure uh, on the communications plan uh, is helpful. Um, they will be and have been monitoring luggage and uh, uh, other supplies uh, to try to identify that no uh, party materials are uh, being sent or provided to any rooms. Uh, as Karen mentioned, the increased security measures uh, in the hotel at elevators complemented with uh, increased surveillance uh, measures. Um, uh, to identify unusual activity, unusual noise, unusual disturbances. Um, uh, tr en enhanced training of, uh, they by the time they got our notice on Thursday, they had already planned uh, uh, training with management and they've had a series of meetings where management and senior management have been tasked with implementing these additional measures and those have then in order to implement them included uh, personnel being brought off of fur furlough uh, to make sure that the resources uh, are uh, are available there's been a reviewing of social media uh, some of the uh, guests who may have been planning events uh, communicate this on social media so there is an aspect of monitoring social media as well. Um, you know, Bruce can uh, update you on um, uh, some of the monitoring aspects of this. They have included a number of uh, shutdowns of uh, uh, over occupancy in uh, multiple rooms, I think nearing the double digit mark. Uh, now, none of those um, violated the 25 person governor's rule, but uh, all of them did violate the uh, properties uh, occupancy limits for rooms uh, and for suites. Uh, so that is a summary of the measures that we've acquired that they have implemented. Uh, I do want to say from my seat as well, uh, Chair, you mentioned that there uh, that is taking it very seriously and uh, from my seat as well uh, that's my uh, experience as well that um, this kind of uh, flouting uh, of the uh, safety measures uh, is uh, unacceptable uh, to the property and they have put uh, significant action and resources behind it uh Madam Chair, Commissioners, I, I would agree with Deputy Director uh, Lilio's assessment that uh, there was a big change at Encore over this past weekend. Uh, they were extremely vigilant in their duties. Uh, uh, what we saw is not only were guests uh, changed their mind about their, their weekend registration at the desk when they found out the new rules, but uh, uh, through their vigilance, uh, eight different uh, rooms were evicted for uh, breaking those rules and uh, fined as well. So uh, Encore seems to be uh, holding fast to their new rules and, uh, uh, you know, uh, really sticking to their guns as, uh, as far as to what they uh, are, are trying to get the guests to abide by. I was impressed with uh, uh, this because you know, that's not easy to do with your, your loyal guests, per se. Anybody have any questions about that or? Okay. Well, um, yeah, thank you. Well, uh, without necessarily getting into specifics, it's fair to say that um, by uh, the, the notion of trying to ensure that only hotel guests are on the floors as well as um, that, uh, that there's a limit to the number of people in any given uh, uh, room or suite, that they've implemented uh, additional measures to just simply somebody waving a key, let's say, um, in front of security to get past the security elevators. Is that, is that a fair statement that there's, they're now gonna be checking for 
things like last name of the person who's reserved the room or how many people may be at a given time or gone through the floor, uh, like counting people that come in and out of um, particular floors? Yeah. Yes, they, they have implemented uh, measures to, to make sure that uh, hotel guests are going up uh, only upstairs. Uh, that you know this includes uh, uh, having guards make rounds on the floor as well. You know, for they can actually hear the noise on these floors as well. Uh, being more vigilant at the hotel as to who's going upstairs uh, uh, as well. So uh, I th I think they're you know getting this really under control as well. We've given them uh, some suggestions as to what we've seen at other casino hotels as well over the years. All right. Deputy Director Lilius, did you want to add in? Uh, just to note that it, it is a tall measure and it requires uh, managing the property in a way that a hotel isn't typically managed. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, from my understanding, you know, when there are noise complaints, that is when a hotel would kick in uh, and try to protect, you know, other guests from disruption. Uh, so it has required a shifting of, you know, how to run the hotel property uh, in compliance uh, with some of these other safety measures. And there has been some creative thought given to, you know, how to identify uh, red flags and, uh, evidence uh, that indicates uh, a prohibitive gather prohibited gathering maybe being planned or, or taking place uh, beyond what a hotel is is you know used to, to doing um, other questions commissioner Cameron yeah yeah well I I hope it, it sounds like they do realize how important this is which I'm happy to hear um, Certainly, this is much more serious than a guest being disturbed by noise. And, um, you know, whatever measures they had before obviously were not effective enough. And um, so I am, I am pleased to see that they are, they understand the seriousness of it and put in the measures, not only that we recommended, but that they thought of themselves to, uh, to um, really curtail this from ever happening again. It's that serious. So um, that's the most important part of your briefing to me is the fact that the licensee uh, understands not just that they would be penalized by us, but they, they really do understand the importance of protecting health and safety. Yes. Other questions? Commissioner O'Brien? More a, a, a comment than a question, which is, um, it, it, I, it, Thank Executive Director Wells, Interim Executive Director Wells for the update that she gave this morning. And I also want to thank her and the members of IEB who gave us updates um, right after this happened. And so to be clear, this is something that uh, I laud IEB's actions under the statute. I laud the fact that um, you came to the commissioners and updated us. Um, and I want to reiterate also that while um, I, do, I do think they appreciate the severity of the laps that happened at that time and that they've taken steps. Um, I also want to say that there's a reason that the statute allows for emergency action by the commission if anything should happen that is in fact imminently dangerous to anyone. Uh, that is not what happened last weekend uh, as far as we know. However, um, while they do take it seriously, I do want to also say that um, given the situation that we are in, um, if we would need to take any further action, we could. I think that as stated by Loretta Lilios and uh, Direct, Executive Director Ban, Deputy Director Ban, I think that we are in a situation where they take it seriously and they're acting appropriately and we in fact see the fruits of that action. Um, so I am pleased with that. But I, I just also wanted to put praise out to uh, the people on our end who made sure that we were in the loop and responding what was a very serious issue. Uh, Commissioner Stephens. Yeah, Madam Chair, just to just to echo that point and thank the IEB and uh, the GEU for the great work that they did. I'm encouraged by the response so far of our licensee, um, and you know it appears they are taking this very seriously. And certainly, the word is getting out to their to their guests, who those are the ones who canceled their reservation and decided that they weren't going to take that risk. Um, 
but you know the broader message to the general public of you know we're still operating within these public health safety guidelines don't be foolish don't jeopardize the livelihoods of all these encore employees who have been brought back to work uh, and could be at risk of uh, of of having gaming operations suspended again if if activities like this continue to take place so um, thanks to IB and the GEU for their good work their immediate work their rapid response to this uh, as well as uh, the work of our licensees but uh, you know we can hope the general public and the gaming patron can be a little smarter about this. Commissioner Zinnika. Yeah, I, on, on that note, actually, I had a question. Um, I know that the $500 citation is um, something that um, has been implemented as part of this uh, um, the pandemic, really, um, in terms of um, from, from the governor. Um, does that apply to only the person who rented the room in this case? Does that apply to everybody in attendance to a gathering like this? Um, and this, do, do we know if, um, if more than the person who rented uh, the room in this case was cited for, for the gathering? Right. Do you know the answer to that? My, just from my memo, I think it was only the person that rented the room. But I don't know. Do you have any other further information on that? Uh, that's the information that I have. Is that the uh, the registered guest, uh, the young man who rented the room, uh, was the one who was uh, cited uh, for for that. Um, you know, it's possible that that could have could have been more broadly uh, implemented. But uh, it's my information that it was only only he. Uh, the uh, fines that the hotel is implementing are significantly higher than that. I think in the $3,000 range for violating the occupancy limit alone, uh, and that is over and above any damage uh, to the room that they would charge back to the guest. Yeah, and I wonder, I mean, I don't know if, um, if, there, if anybody has an answer for this, but whether that citation could be applied more broadly to everybody in attendance where these two happen again, might also be uh, hopefully a deterrent um, along the lines of what um, Commissioner Stevens was saying. Um, it, it takes many people to be, to act um, foolishly to um, not just the person who, who you know, and, and that was at the, the top of, of, you know, renting the room with the intention to, to organize a gathering. Um, but I, I wonder if there would be, um, the possibility of applying that uh, citation more broadly, would this ever happen in any other way? Deputy Director Lilios, do you want to address that? That's certainly something we can look at. I do know that for the the um, the party that we're talking about, that the uh, primary objective of GEU and security was to safely disperse people at that time. So that was the priority, you know, at three o'clock in the morning uh, when they were called there. Uh, but, you know, moving forward, it's my understanding that the Board of Health, as well as law enforcement uh, at the state and local level, do have the authority to issue those civil citations. It's certainly something we can, can look at. Uh, thinking about as a deterrent, uh, uh, deterrent piece. So I just wanted to add one point um, to, to, I think it's a clarification, but perhaps everybody, and I'm sure everybody understands it fully, is that this notice of non-compliance that was issued is a very serious step. Um, it's a serious step that uh, <clears throat> when, as Commissioner O'Brien noted, we were uh, it was brought to our attention through uh, the restart group and then appropriately under the open meeting law, um, the team did inform each commissioner individually. What was most egregious in this instance was not simply the actions of the public who it is not understandable given the risk to not only each other, but to all the people in the hotel. And then as we know, we can look at examples here in New England how it will affect the general public and the community. But what was egregious here for me was that that happened and our licensee got notice over three hours. And at least one employee, the butler, did exactly the right thing. 
and went and notified the, his fellow employees to have action taken. And what's really important here for our licensees is to not only enforce the measures that they're taking to ensure further safety for all given the pandemic we're in, but to also remember to keep those channels open to make sure they are hearing their employees when they make reports of instances that put others at harm's risk. So that's why I think that this, this particular incident in light of all the complexities for all of our licensees at this time was taken so seriously this, and, and IEB acted. So again, it, um, the reporting could happen in any climate. And we encourage our licensees to be listening to their employees with respect to these risks. Um, additional commissioner Zinnick, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, I just, just to say thank you for that uh, uh, clarification. Um, I still think that, uh, you know, um, the, the, the X factor here is a public that oh, uh, yes. unfortunately includes, uh, will continue to include, uh, you know, notwithstanding the measures that are now taking place, which I think are very important. Um, unfortunately, there's still at least the possibility that a very small uh, group of, 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 of people may feel like, you know, that a gathering is not a big deal and want to attempt something again. Um, yeah. and to yes, please don't think that my remark diminished the import of yours. I'm not sure exactly of our ability to actually enforce those um, payments. And, and I think, uh, Deputy Director Lilios, maybe you know, know whether we have any jurisdiction over the $500. Um, uh, gaming Commission uh, on its own do, is not authorized to issue those citations. And, and you're correct, Chair, that our, the IEB's focus, uh, well, GEU's focus was on safely uh, you know, clearing the scene, getting folks home in a safe uh, manner. Uh, and uh, GEU, uh, IEB's focus uh, was on uh, you know, identifying the uh, non-compliance uh, to the uh, our licensee uh, and uh, directing measures uh, to uh, ensure that it doesn't happen again. So that was where our focus was, and that's where our uh, statutory authority is. Is that helpful, Commissioner Zuniga? Yeah, thank you, thank you. I, I, I understand that. I think we can that. follow up on. Yeah, I think we can follow up on it with our colleagues. Yeah. I, I I understand what 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 becomes a, the highest priority at a time when you have already you know a, a group of a large gathering, um, but to the extent that it's possible to get a name and a phone number, let's say, and and you know from everybody who's who's, who's being escorted, were this ever to happen again, and I and I hope really I hope that that doesn't happen again. Um, maybe it's um, it's something that we could at least explore. What other um, recourse there is towards other people who are not just the person renting a room, but other people who are also contributing to the, to the risk. Any other questions for Karen, Loretta, or Bruce? I'm seeing none. Very thorough report. As I mentioned, you know, swift action. It had, had to be very swift and thorough and accurate given the risk. So um, I know Again, I just am repeating myself. Thank you for the, for that, and uh, for the licensees, all three, for their continued vigilance on this um, on these matters. You know, I can only say what I've said before: is this won't be forever. You know, it, the, but we have to while we're in this situation where the public health metrics are where they are. We've just got to be really uh, everyone has got to take full responsibility for their actions. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll move on to item four C. Want to yep. give an update on the MGC office reopening their working group update. Uh, so uh, we do continue to have, uh, as evidenced by the, the prior report, on-site gaming agent and GEU presence at the casinos. Uh, however, I do want to report that we issued a notice that we will continue to have the rest of our staff. Uh, telework through uh, December 31st of 2020. Oh, I should also mention there are also racing employees that are that are on site at Plain Ridge as, as along with uh, gaming agents in the GEU. 
Uh, so unless otherwise directed by a manager uh, based on the agency's operational need and pursuant to the governor's guidelines and the governor's orders, we are keeping people at home and teleworking uh, and continuing to do that at least through December 31st of this year, 2020. Uh, the Gaming Commission, we did adopt the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, telework policy for the purpose of managing teleworking arrangements uh, and resulting from the pandemic. Uh, now, certain provisions of that policy uh, have been suspended or updated due to this coronavirus pandemic and the, uh, the conditions uh, required by that health situation. So we, we do have an addendum to that. So we have use the policy, modified it as necessary, just to keep our folks working as much and as efficiently as possible. Uh, we have arranged for additional equipment to be transferred for home use. Uh, we'll be distributing those uh, tomorrow and Monday, for example, monitors, chairs, things where if people are really not coming back into the office for a while, they may be able to be more comfortable uh, and, and work more efficiently if they have some of their um, equipment that's now located at the office. Uh, we've also provided employees, uh, again, with the ITS acceptable use policy for state equipment. So we're monitoring all this with policy and tracking. Uh, and additionally, the working group uh, met again yesterday, discussed this and some other measures as far as, you know, keeping people safe. How can we advise people on ergonomics and working from home and, and just communicating uh, to the staff that we recognize that this is hard. You know, I think all of us are, you know, there's a sense of weariness from working at home. I think it would be nice to be back in the office, have some socialization, change up the routine. Uh, so, you know, the message to the staff is that, you know, we recognize this is hard. We're trying our best. Uh, this is a pandemic. We're in extreme situations, uh, an extreme situation. We appreciate what the staff is doing. Um, and they, they've really, risen to the occasion to work for months now in this situation, uh, and they've been doing a good job. So I appreciate that. I wanna say thank you to the staff, uh, and we'll continue to monitor how people are doing, try to communicate as best we can on everything that we know that's going on, uh, just so people, people can feel connected. And, and again, an, another shout out to the IT department. You know, The technology we've been using has been uh, effective in keeping people in touch and communicating and keeping the work going. So. You know, I don't know if uh, Commissioner Stebbins or Commissioner Cameron wants to comment on any of that at, at this point because they've been instrumental in that working group and have been monitoring and checking in on, on how people are doing and wanting to help as far as making this telework uh, effective and, and, and work for the people that, that work for the commission. Commissioner Cameron? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, I would just like to... Um, you know, speak to the preparedness of our team, meaning every time we have one of these reopening meetings, they are very well prepared, not only with what the governor's office, the latest information that's coming out, but best practices coming out, HR measures to help employees, um, very thoughtful discussions about, okay, we have a hybrid plan here. We had a discussion yesterday about gaming agents and some things that might make that work stronger, but how do we do that safely? And um, so I, I just appreciate the level of preparedness. This is not willy nilly, let's try this. It really is thoughtful um, conversation and well-informed conversation because our team has attended these, uh, these uh, meetings that the governor's office has prepared for each aspect of a reopening. So I just want to commend our team for not only caring so much about our employees as well as the health and safety of patrons, um, but um, how to do this in a way that makes sense and by still following the rules, but being effective and efficient at the same time. So just a thank you to the team um, for the work they put into this and how much they care. Commissioner Stebbins. Yeah, just to, to add on, and I echo Commissioner Cameron's comments, and uh, you know, thanks to Karen and thanks to our CFAO, Derek Lennon, and the whole team for, again, following the latest guidelines, making sure that we're doing everything that the governor's uh, team is suggesting. Uh, again, we talked about it yesterday, which is making sure that everybody has a, uh, a safe, um, place to work at home. You know, they're not trying to juggle a laptop on top of a refrigerator and um, potentially creating some type of workplace injury. We don't want that to happen. 
Um, so the idea that you know the team will be able to have access to a desk and to monitors and again to everything to help them uh, more effectively or um, to better work from home in a safe environment is critical. But uh, kudos to the team. They've been thoughtful about this and following every guideline that's coming out of the governor's office and the other uh, public health agencies. I, I should just uh, give a little shout out because you're referencing the good work of um, the governor's uh, HRD team and Jeff McHugh is the, the chief of that division. And he generously offered um, our, um, an invita made an invitation to our team to join his and the work that they were doing. And it has turned out to be so instrumental. So we're very, very fortunate that they thought of us. So to Jeff McHugh, we give, give a great deal of uh, thanks. And thanks to that team. You know, I have to, you know, Karen, I know that you noted Derek, you know, right in the smack in the middle of budget. Yeah. You know, was scooting yes. down to help Alex and team with, right. with um, you know, uh, PPE and making sure that the signage was ready and helping Alex. And so it has been, you know, right. all, everybody on, on foot. So thank you. And Commissioners Cameron and Stephens, thanks. That work will continue. And you know, that's one thing that I, I would note about our senior staff is, um, you know, I look at, you know, this in this piece, we've got Derek and Tripti and Katrina, and they're all working mm -hmm. selflessly. You know, they're putting, they're putting their staff and their teams, you know, uh, ahead of themselves, and they're offering to do what's ever necessary. And it's, you know, I just want to compliment them for that. And also just say what a pleasure it is to be a part of that, that team, uh, because that's the kind of environment you want to work in. So we appreciate it. And it is a lean team. It is. I got to tell you, I was thinking about that this morning, and I was like, yeah, you know. Well, thank you. Yeah, they're, they're, they're really pulling together, so thank you. So uh, that concludes my administrative update. Great. Oh, yeah, and, and we do have a, a, a one note. I just got a chat to remember that uh, Derek, aside from all that he's doing, is also covering the licensing division, mm -hmm. which is a very important job right now. So thank you for that. And thank you to Marianne uh, Gratton for reminding me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And, and thank you to the licensing team. Yep. Right. And, and yeah. even on the other side, we've also got Loretta that has done so much work on the uh, and the the external component. You know, we're talking about the internal component, but Loretta's doing all that work with the, you know, the, the uh, external component and all that too. There's just so many people to hold to, so I can't say thank you enough. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, I think we can move on to item number five then, Karen. Um, Dr. Lightbound, um, the racing division, you have a horse racing update, and then we'll continue with the details. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm pleased to um, report that wearing of the masks um, at Plain Ridge over the nose has gotten much better. Um, everybody was wearing their masks, but sometimes they weren't keeping them up over their nose, which is something I've noticed out in, you know, general, in the general public as well. Um, so, um, uh, Sevo Tools Group is doing a great job making announcements during the day. They're sending um, email notices out during the day as well and other um, you know, ways of reminding everybody to do that, um, as well as uh, help from the Horsemen's Association in reminding everybody as well. So that's going very well. Um, and uh, the reports from the simulcast facilities are that everybody's um, complying with the requirements of wearing their masks and everything, and they haven't had any um, problems with that. Um, not this Saturday, but the following Saturday, September 5th is the uh, Kentucky Derby. Um, obviously, with COVID, um, it's a very different uh, world out there. Um, they are not going to have um, fans at the Derby, which is going to be very different. Um, and um, it will, it's the second race of the Triple Crown this year. Um, the Belmont has already been run. So the three races are being run in a different order. So we're really not sure what the... Um, betting will be on this race, but obviously it's going to be a big day for all um, three facilities. And they're um, looking at their COVID plans as far as um, adding security and things like that, just to be sure that if there is an increased um, number of patrons, they're ready to handle that. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to the racing division team. Um, in the hot weather, uh, wearing the mask is very difficult. Um, and a lot of our staff does work outside. 
Um, so on a day like today, they're all going to be very happy. <laughs> Uh, they've done a great job. And um, as you all were mentioning, um, Agnes has been down bringing supplies to us, and Jacqueline has also brought things down to us. So I really appreciate um, the whole staff working together to support the racing division. Um, and with that, I can go on to the next um, agenda item, unless anybody has a question. Commissioner Cameron, did you want to add anything in? Um, I, I don't have a question, but uh, and I appreciate uh, Dr. Leipheim giving the shout out to her team, but I would like to give the shout out to her. Her leadership has been instrumental here. And uh, there have been, you know, this is difficult for everybody. So sometimes tensions are high. Um, there are concerns, but a steady hand in the leadership role has been, and, and really behind the scenes, putting out little fires, um, um, Dr. Leipam mentioned uh, the uh, uh, the mask situation. She personally has been involved with reminding people. I mean, that's not typically something a racing director would get involved with, but I don't think there's an aspect of uh, all of the protocols that we put in place that uh, she has not been on top of. And um, really, that that says a lot to your team when you're out there working as hard as you're asking them to work under difficult circumstances. So just, I want to credit Dr. Lightbaum for her efforts to really make this opening safe, which, which it has been so far. Thank you very much. Moving on then, if there are no other uh, comments or questions yet. Okay, moving on to your next item, Alex, thanks. Okay, so the uh, next item is the Horse Racing Committee. Um, decision on the split of the racehorse development uh, fund and um, I'd like to give a shout out to the committee members of the horse racing um, committee um, chair Brian Fitzgerald Emily Katunek, um, Joe Savage Peter Goldberg and of course um, Commissioner Cameron um, this year they had uh, multiple meetings they asked for a lot of different information um, had very thoughtful deliberation um, to reach their decision, um, which is so important to the horsemen as it touches on things that are vitally important to them, such as um, the purses, the money that would go towards the breeding, and um, health and welfare and pension. So um, again, um, there really was a lot of work that this committee did this year. Um, and I'd also like to commend the horsemen. Um, they all were um, very good about supplying information that the committee requested and um, where you're splitting up a pot of money among different people. Um, it can be challenging, but everybody um, works through it in a cooperative way. So I, I wanted to bring that to the commission's attention. And Thank I'm you. And before, oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, before we, we move on to the actual um, item, I do understand uh, General Counsel Grossman that you would like to actually move up one of the regulatory provisions um, out of just simply in 6C to help um, in the ordering of this, am I correct? That's exactly right, Madam Chair, and thank you. And uh, thank you to Dr. Lightbaum for that great uh, intro. I, yeah, I second everything nice. she just said uh, there. Just as a matter of uh, procedure, I think it would make sense to move item 6C up before the actual substantive discussion about the split recommendations. You'll recall item 6C uh, pertain to the amendments uh, to a number of uh, regulations that uh, address the distribution percentage from the Racehorse Development Fund. That's 205 CMR 149.04 uh, paragraph four. There was a, a public hearing convened this morning presided over by Commissioner Stebbins. Um, and I apologize, I wasn't uh, there, so I certainly, uh, at some point turn to Commissioner Stebbins uh, to offer any comments about that uh, public hearing. But by way of background, um, if the commission's okay with proceeding with this item, um, there should is we just a pause on, should we pause on that and just ask for Commissioner Stebbins, did, were there any additional comments? Sure, Madam Chair, thanks. Um, no, this was, uh, was a relatively quiet uh, public hearing on the regulations. Uh, we were considering three this morning that are on our agenda for today, uh, but there were no comments offered by the general public uh, with respect to this regulation or the other two. And, okay, excellent. And then just to make sure, uh, 
for my fellow commissioners, you're able to find, because we did go out of order on the materials, you're able to find the memo? Okay, excellent, thanks. Okay. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So uh, as just referenced, there's the cover sheet in the packet, which describes the purpose of the law governing the distribution of funds from the Racehorse Development Fund, um, as well as an outline of the proposed amendments. Um, and the amendments, of course, are in red line form. They're in the packet. There's some green language in there too, but the red and the green both uh, represent the changes that are before you here today. Um, you'll recall, uh, as we've discussed previously, the familiar 80-16-4 percentage breakdown that's described in Chapter 23K, Section 60, for purpose, uh, which uh, goes to purses for live racing, breeding, and health and pension uh, funding, respectively. Uh, notably, just by way of uh, refresher, historically all the funds have been distributed in those three categories in accordance with one overall split percentage. So now if these amendment, amendments are adopted, and they have been in effect by emergency, uh, but if they're adopted for a final promulgation here today, there could be three separate split percentages for each of the three categories. Um, this reg has been in effect since June 4th, and pursuant to that language, the Horse Racing Committee met on July 15th to review the existing split percentage, which was uh, put in place at some point um, in the past year, which you'll recall is presently set at 65% to the standard bred uh, industry and 35% to support the thoroughbred industry. And the committee uh, met to make an updated recommendation uh, to the commission, which of course, as we know, is uh, incidentally um, on the agenda for discussion right after we talk about uh, this amendment, or these amendments, I should say. Um, so as, as we've heard, the public hearing on these regs was held this morning. Um, Additionally, the, race, the Horse Racing Committee put the concept out for public comment to the uh, racing industry. There were certainly no objections uh, to that and the committee itself uh, supported these changes. Um, you may recall just by way of uh, procedural note that certain horse racing related regulations have to be submitted to the legislature prior to taking effect. That's required in accordance with Chapter 128A, uh, Section 9B. That section, though, only applies to regulations that are promulgated in accordance with Chapter 128A. The regulations you have before you here today are being reviewed in, under Chapter 23K. So there is no requirement that they be submitted uh, to the legislature under that section. However, just as a, a point of procedural note, the actual recommendations made by the committee were sent to the legislature in accordance with section 60 of chapter 23k. So the legislature is uh, looped into this whole process uh, through that uh, avenue. Um, so as, as well, uh, with, with that, uh, that is basically an overview. Uh, we can get into the details of the amendments if that's helpful, but the baseline is just that they move uh, the regulations from a place where one split percentage had to be uh, put in place to one that just allows the commission and the committee uh, to make separate recommendations. That's really all the regulation amendments do. The uh, recommendations themselves are a separate issue, uh, but this would allow for those recommendations to be made in that fashion. So um, perhaps I can pause there um, and see if there's any questions or comments uh, before we move into uh, the adoption mode. Any questions on, on the, the regulation? Of course, as uh, General Counsel Grossman points out, this, we did act on as an emergency regulation. Are there questions? Oh, I, I'm hearing, oh, Commissioner Zunica. Yeah, perhaps just to highlight and emphasize um, that notwithstanding the lack of comments this morning, that there's um, quite a bit of input that has uh, been uh, provided through the race, Horse Racing Committee and the membership uh, for both uh, the organizations of the Thoroughbred and the Standard Bread uh, that, that, um, that arrived at, uh, at this point. Uh, 
Um, so there's um, that's an important part of the process that we have taken advantage of because we have that uh, structure of the race horse racing community. That's a really good point. Commissioner Cameron, I know you probably were going to um, reference that in conjunction with the substantive discussion uh, up for today. Correct. You might just want to remind you might want to just remind the public of the racing um, horse racing committee's uh, construct. Yes. Would you like me to do that now? Well, um, just in terms of the con the const it, it, who who is actually on well, it. Well, uh, Dr. Lightbaum just mentioned uh, the individuals. So yeah. the treasurer has um, has a position that she appoints uh, Emily, and um, certainly the governor appoints the chair. And Brian uh, Fitzgerald is serving in that capacity now. Uh, the gaming commission has one spot, and I uh, have served in that position since the beginning as the representative. Um, on the racing committee from the gaming commission, and then each breed has a representative um, on the uh, on the committee. So there is uh, an attorney representative for each of the two breeds, um, which is very helpful in many ways because they do have the substantive uh, knowledge and and uh, are able to provide uh, documents that are very helpful to the committee in doing its work. So that's the five person committee um, and those individuals have changed over the years, but um, I have to say this year's uh, committee worked extremely hard and um, really was uh, attention to detail with with this decision this year. Right. And so to uh, Enrique's point that the, 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 uh, the lack of comment today does mm -hmm. not in any way reflect the investment of all the stakeholders. Oh, no. In the oh, oh, no. In fact, they were actively involved the entire time, as the racing folks always are, frankly, they are engaged. It's a very engaged community, very passionate community um, on, on both sides with, with both breeds. So yes, we, um, we hear from them, um, we listen to them and incorporate their thoughts into, our, um, um, into uh, the work that we do. Excellent. So back to the regulation, are there any uh, questions for Todd with respect to the regulation? Hearing none, shall we go ahead and act? Do we have a motion? And so the first, of course, we have the amended small business impact statement. It's in the packet uh, for your consideration. Um, if if uh, you're, we're ready, uh, that would be the first item uh, that would be appropriate for right. consideration. Um, yes, uh, Todd, and this is for uh, 205 CMR 149.04. Is that correct? That's that's correct. Then, Madam Chair, I'll be happy to move that the Commission approve the the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 149.04. Uh, those are the race course development fund distributions, escrow accounts, as included in the Commissioner's plan. Second. Any questions, edits? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes. Thank you, Shara. And <clears throat> follow. Yes, I further move, uh, Madam Chair, that the Commission adopt the version of 205 CMR 149.04 the Racehorse Development Fund, distributions, escrow accounts, as included in the Commissioner's packet, and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any questions on that? Okay. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. I vote yes, five zero. Thank you. So that puts you in a posi position that's um, helpful for continuing the discussion on item number five B, uh, back to as Alex sort of primed us for the, the discussion on the split. Thanks. Uh, Todd's going to continue from here. On the thank you. Yes. Discussion. Thank you, yes, Todd. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Leipon. Um So with, with that, uh, Having been completed, that was very helpful. Um, 
I think we should have a quick look at the governing law. We're now talking about the recommendations that are before you as made by the Horse Racing Committee as to what the split should be. And um, as you've noted and you've seen, the Horse Racing Committee made use of the new regulations uh, to make these regulations. So there are three separate percentage splits before you in each of the three categories. Um, and I thought since things are a little bit different this year that I'd just take a, a minute or two just to run through the governing law and some of the standards that you need to look at um, in determining whether to approve these recommendations. Uh, the, the dis so the distribution of funds from the Racehorse Development Fund is of course governed by Chapter 23K Section 60. As we know, that section established the Racehorse Development Fund itself and provides that the commission shall administer the fund. It also, in that section, created the Horse Racing Committee, the sole purpose of which is to make recommendations to the commission as to how funds shall be distributed. Uh, the statute does set out certain criteria that the committee had to consider in making its recommendations, and it, it considered other additional criteria, but there are a couple set out in the statute that it had to, um, and I'll, I'll just go through those uh, quickly by way of refresher. Um, it had to consider the average purses awarded at thoroughbred and standard bred racing facilities, the total employment numbers, both direct and indirect, attributable, attributable to each horse racing industry. Uh, it considered the relative needs of each horse racing industry for increased purses. It considered the amount of the live racing handle generated by each horse racing industry. And fifth, it considered the number of breeding and training farms of each industry that are located in the Commonwealth. So those are the statutory criteria and all were considered um, as uh, we'll get into momentarily uh, by the committee. The statute uh, then requires that the committee submit the recommendation to the clerks of the Senate and the House um, no uh, sooner than 30 days before the commission looks at it. And that was in fact done. Um, I believe a copy of that notice is actually in the packet or and here before you today uh, for your reference. The existing distribution percentage, just by way of uh, background, you'll recall, was set by the commission within the past year at 65% to the standard breads and 35% to the thoroughbreds. The statute provides that the commission shall only change the percentage upon a recommendation of the horse racing committee. And they have in fact made a, a recommendation for the change. Um, it does require very clearly though that it's the commission and not the committee that is the ultimate body that approves the percentages. So that is the, um, the matter that is before you here today. On July 15th, the horse racing committee as described did meet and voted to recommend uh, that the existing split percentages be changed as outlined in uh, the packet. Um, that so that there be one uh, split percentage for each of the three statutory categories. Um, and unless there are questions about the law or the process, I'd, I'd like to turn things over to Commissioner Cameron, who will walk through uh, the discussion that the committee undertook in reaching some of uh, the recommendations. Thank you, uh, General Counsel Grossman. Um, if I, I'd like to start with just explaining um, that in the past, we did look at this as, as just one split. All three categories were addressed in one legal brief and the committee would you know, look at that documentation, ask questions and come to a decision. Frankly, we struggled with um, really for the last two years, the fact that there were some needs on the health and welfare side in particular with the thoroughbred um, industry and that, you know, changing those splits um, to favor the, the standard breads because they were doing more racing. There were some real life impacts that we struggled with. Um, and I want to commend um, General Counsel Grossman because he was there. He heard the, our discussions about this and volunteered, frankly, to take a look at the law and see if there was a way we could address those um, that need 
uh, differently. Meaning, is could we, in fact, legally um, make decisions about those three categories um, separately, um, giving us a legal recommendation that we could? That's how this issue came before the commission, and I do want to thank the, uh, my fellow commissioners for listening and understanding that that was an issue. And as we did today, first in an emergency um, move, and secondly today, we just uh, promulgated officially um, the fact that this new regulation does allow the committee to work this way. Um, so under, under uh, the emergency regulation, we were able to ask each breed each industry to provide documentation in each three three of those categories, meaning um, make your case for more money um, for purses, for breeding, um, and and for health and uh, pension benefits. And um, they did that. So we looked at more information this year um, and were really able to um, make recommendations based separately on each category. Um, Certainly, as everyone on this uh, commission knows, the standard bread um, industry has a live racetrack. They are conducting a full racing meet, and um, you know their employment numbers are higher. Um, the need for the purse money, they made a, a certainly a, a greater case for that, and uh, which led to our decision to um, to to recommend five percent more for the standard bread industry this year, which, which would mean 70% um, um, to the standard bread and 30% to the um, thoroughbred industry. Um, that was the decision, um, the majority of the uh, committee, and, um, and that's the recommendation before the commission now. When it comes to breeding, um, again, documents were provided uh, that clearly demonstrated to the committee that the majority of the breeding was being done on the standard bread side. Uh, that industry, again, for the reasons we just talked about, they have a live racetrack, they have a place to race, thus that in itself encourages breeding. Um, the uncertainty of thoroughbred racing has um, certainly slowed down breeding on the thoroughbred side and, um, and thus, um, and frankly, the only place to race for the uh, this year would be um, would be elsewhere outside of Massachusetts because they don't have a place to race in in Massachusetts. So, um, after reviewing those documents, the committee made the decision to um, to provide five percent more to make that recommendation. So again, the standard breads so that would be seventy percent, and the thoroughbred um, industry a thirty percent. That is the recommendation of the committee. Um, where we looked at things differently was with um, the health and pension benefits. Um, you know, this is an area where there are a number of individuals. Um, from the thoroughbred horsemen and women who are actually using those benefits now. Um, and, and really the case was made, names were provided, services were provided. Um, and, and so the committee really, and on the um, standard bread side, those benefits are typically going for a pension plan at the end. So you do your, you run for a number of years and you're eligible um, um, for pension benefits. So, the committee really saw the need on the thoroughbred side to provide additional benefits for individuals who are actively using those benefits in sport now. And um, so that uh, number was, was dramatically changed and 40% um, of those monies will go to the standard bread, that's the recommendation, and 60% to the thoroughbred because they really were able to demonstrate and provide documentation of, of a greater need. So um, this, this decision by the commission to authorize the committee to work in this way had real life uh, results, frankly, and I think we'll be able to, um, to really meet the needs of, of both, uh, both industries in a way that makes the most sense for this year. So that's the work of the committee this year and um, um, and again, it really did help that we were able to look at this differently. And again, I want to commend um, 
um, General Counsel Grossman, because he, he volunteered. He said, let me take a look. Maybe there's something we can do differently here. So that was very, very helpful. And Commissioner Cameron, can you just help explain the, 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 the three big buckets in terms of the percentages there? The 80%, 16%, 4%? Sure. So, so yeah, I, I should have mentioned that. So 80% of the money I talked about, um, the, I talked about purses, and that would be the 70%, but that, uh, according to the statute, that 80% of the horse racing development fund goes to purses. So of that 80%, the decision was made to go 70, standard bred 30, um, a 30 um, thorough, uh, thoroughbred. And then 16% by statute um, of those monies um, go to the breeding programs for each breed. And again, that, that was the 70% to the standard bred, the 30% to the uh, thoroughbred, and 4% is the um, distribution for health and uh, pension benefits. And as I just explained, that would be 40% this year, the recommendation to the standard bread and 60% to the um, thoroughbred industry. Thank you for asking me to clarify that. Just wanted to clarify there's no discretion with respect to the three big You're, buckets. The discretion correct. came with the division. Correct. Any questions? I, I will just point out that um, Given what 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 I know about um, the state of the of racing bo in both breeds, um, you know, over the years, uh, that this change in the split uh, makes a, a lot of intuitive sense. Mm -hmm. um, as as you point out, you know, the um, the needs, uh, you know, as the statute says, um, relative to purses and and breeding, the, the 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 directive is clear that it's based on on what the industry is doing. But it's not surprising um, that um, the health and safety uh, needs uh, would, would be much greater um, when it comes to that uh, small percentage, but a significant one in terms of people's livelihoods um, on, on the um, still uh, very almost inactive um, um, thoroughbred uh, industry. Again, with exceptions that we all know well, but um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy and persuaded, of course, that uh, all the work that was done resulted in, in what appears a very intuitive and solid recommendation. Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner Stebbins, questions for Commissioner Cameron, General Counsel Grossman, and Alex, Dr. Lightbound. No, no, I think it all makes intuitive sense, as I said. Um, I, th I think they put a lot of thought into how to split it up. It makes sense to me. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, makes sense to me. Um, I had the opportunity to, to watch the, the racing committee uh, meeting virtually like we all did um, and, uh, and appreciate the great back and forth and um, give each industry the you know, credit for raising the issues that are important and backing it up with good data and good information. So uh, thanks to Commissioner Cameron for all her good work. Thank you, Commissioner Cameron, and thank you for the very thorough report today. I'm all set. I feel as though um, we've looked at this carefully, and I just, I'm very appreciative of the Horse Racing Committee doing its work. It's my understanding it's a recommendation, uh, Todd, that comes to us. Um, we, even if we, if we had any suggested changes, we really would not be able to make those suggestions now. It would be a vote to approve or out send back. Is that a fair characterization of the process? That's right. That's the way I read the statute. Absolutely. Okay. So given that um, and hearing that everybody feels really um, sufficiently briefed and satisfied and, and impressed by the, the overall process and thoughtfulness so far, do we have a motion on this matter? Or further discussion? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd move that the commission approve the recommendations submitted by the Horse Racing Committee in accordance with General Law Chapter 23K, Section 60, as follows. 80% of the distributions from the Racehorse Development Fund for purses for live races shall be split 70% to standard bread and 30% to thoroughbred. 
16% of the distributions for breeding programs shall be split 70% to standard bred and 30% to thoroughbred, and 4% of the distributions for health and pension benefits shall be split 40% to standard bred and 60% to thoroughbred. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner. Any further questions, last minute thoughts on this? Commissioner Cameron? Okay. Aye. Then, aye. Okay, Commissioner <laughs> Bryan. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes. Thank you, and thank you for all the good work. Five zero, Dr. Lightbound, thank you so, so much. Con I guess you get to continue now um, on item number 5C, please. This item is the um, Pine Ridge Park request for premium free period from June 14th to September 5th of 2020. Uh, this is in accordance with um, Mass General Law 128C, Section 2, Number 4, um, and it's basically a standard operating procedure for the uh, law, if anyone has any questions. Does anybody have any questions on the law itself for uh, General Counsel Grossman? You've seen the... Um, uh, Director O'Toole's request. You're all familiar with this process, I believe. Mm -hmm. No yes. questions. Okay. Do I have a motion? Yeah. Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the request of Plain Ridge Park Casino for a premium free period of Sunday, June 14th through September 5th, 2020, in accordance with uh, General Law 128C24. I second that. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, barring any further questions or edits on this piece, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes. Excellent. Thank you. And then we have Derby Day. Item number 5D. Oh, and there's Director O'Toole. Good morning. morning Thank you, Doc. Oh, yes. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, Dr. Lightbound, if you want to continue, please. Thanks. So this item is um, Plain Ridge Park Casino's request to use the handheld wagering devices, also known as walkabouts, on Derby Day um, as a way to handle um, increased demand um, for wagering opportunities with the COVID. Um, that we're dealing with right now. Um, on Derby Day, there's a um, high interest from um, maybe what you call the casual better. They may not um, bet often enough to have an account wagering um, account, and um, but they do have excitement over the Derby and want to um, maybe come in, get a ticket, and then go home and watch it on TV. Um, so this was a way of um, keeping these folks from having to go into the casino and having interaction, um, but allowing them to bet. So um, the company that would be supplying these handheld devices is Sport Tech, which um, is already uh, licensed by the Gaming Commission on the gaming side. Um, and um, these devices are used, you know, in places like Kentucky, Ohio, uh, New Jersey, New York, Minnesota. Um, speaking with Brian Rogers, the Eastern Field Service Manager, uh, for sport tech, he says they're used um, all over the United States and in Europe. Um, these um, handheld machines can um, print, take a bet in, um, print the ticket out. Um, they can also cash tickets um, or cancel them just like um, a machine in the building could, but these are Wi-Fi enabled, so they can be put where, wherever you want them. Um, today on the call, we have Steve O'Toole, Director of Racing, uh, Lisa McKinney, the compliance manager, and Greg DeMarco, the pandemic safety advisor, um, so they can answer um, questions the commission may have. And um, now I'll turn it over to uh, Steve O'Toole to describe the program in more detail. Good morning. Thank you, Alex. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate Todd uh, being named general counsel. I've worked with Todd since uh, the commission was formed, and uh, uh, he's become well aware and and very well versed in the racing laws, which 
he understands are convoluted at times and very confusing. So uh, he's been very helpful over the past uh, few years for us. So congratulations, Todd. No. Thank you, Steve. And I remember Steve O'Toole used to be one of the people sitting in the way back of the room before there were any licenses or anything like that. And I used to wonder who he was. And now he's come a long way. So thank you, Steve. Um, thanks, Commission, for hearing this request. Um, traditionally, on Kentucky Derby, uh, the, uh, the race is held on the first Saturday in May. And uh, it's it's usually a, a, a very hyped up event. Um, everybody wants to get out of the house early spring and baseball season has just started. So it's kind of a, kind of a bookmark for a lot of people, especially as, as Alex mentioned, the casual uh, customer. And what happens here at Plain Ridge as well, I'm sure as with the other outlets, is that we have an influx of interest on that particular day uh for a number of reasons and what, what a lot of people like to do is come and make their bets and go home and watch the uh races on uh, nbc sports on nbc tv now uh, on that particular day there is also uh, a lot of graded stake races uh which have the interest of some of the casual uh, fans but a lot of the uh, racing enthusiasts so so not only is the derby a drop but also also that, and that's evidenced by NBC, NBC Sports uh, picking up their broadcast at three o'clock and then switching over to the national NBC broadcast around six o'clock to cover the Derby, the Derby specific. So um, what, what happens here is the place gets pretty crowded in, 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 in just the layman's terms. Uh, terms. Uh, we're usually at capacity throughout the entire day uh, on all levels. And, uh, but what a lot of it is, is a lot of foot traffic. A lot of people come in, make their bets, go home and watch watch the races, um, especially with the afternoon coverage of all the great stake races. So uh, in order to uh, try to accomplish this with the COVID situation this year, uh, we thought that a drive through and walk up windows would keep people out of the building, uh, keep them out in the fresh air and uh, be able to handle uh, that as well as uh, keeping uh, the inside building to more of our uh, seasoned customers that are here all the time and want to be in the building to watch the full card of simulcasting from Churchill Downs and other racetracks. Um, there are four major days in racing as far as we're concerned. It's, it kicks off with the Derby and then there's the Breeders' Cup on the Thoroughbred side. There's the Little Brown Jug and the Hamiltonian on the standard bread side and then of course here in massachusetts we've thrown a fifth big day of the spirit of massachusetts and what we did on that particular day was we limited uh through ticket sales uh the occupancy and we we, uh, we offered 300 tickets that day and we kept the crowd under 300 for the uh, space downstairs uh, we intend to do that the same uh the same uh thing for uh the derby and we would never by doing that, I don't think we would ever hit anywhere near the, the 300 because the, 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 a lot of, it's an eight hour day. The racing starts at 1030, I believe in the morning. Uh, we open up at 10 in the morning and it goes through till seven, eight o'clock at night. So it's a, it's, it's a long day. So we would have our afternoon customers that would look for the, come in and look, look at the graded races. And then we'd have the later ones that want to be here for the Derby. <clears throat> so, uh, I don't think we'd ever even come close to the 300 all at one time, especially when we limit it with the tickets. Um, so we, what, what we're proposing is to have two drive-throughs with what's called walkabouts. And a walkabout is just simply a, um, you know, it, it, the, the teller machines downstairs could be like a, like a rotary dial telephone, and the walkabout is like an iPhone. So uh, this is the um, this is the walkabout, and it goes on the teller's wrist like that. Um, turn it on here. So it goes on the teller's teller's wrist, so they have it just like that, and then they turn it on. And I can just log in, and then so it's just a very simple, very large iPhone looking piece, and then this is the printer uh, that goes over. Um, the shoulder of the teller, and it kind of lands around their hip. And so when the when they hit 
the print for the um, for the ticket, uh, the ticket is there. And uh, you know, obviously, in the drive-through, they'll accept the cash first, then rip off the wagers and give them to the to the uh, to the patrons. Uh, we have uh, Greg and Lisa if they wanted to talk about the measures for uh, the protect the protocols, the COVID protocols. Uh, but they will have the uh, uh, plexiglass shields, masks, the drive-through, and the walk-ups will have the plexiglass in front of them. On the walk-ups, we, we probably won't use the uh, walkabouts because we do have data lines into the uh, food uh, court area that we have outside, and we'll just transform that. Uh, those data lines will take the regular machine. So we'll probably just use the regular machines there. We're not looking to use walkabouts there. But we're really not asking for um, the approval of the specific device because the device fits all the uh, it fits all the regulations. It's just a different form of a of a teller machine. Uh, you know, we're looking for the approval, obviously, to accept the wagers outside the building to keep in this atmosphere to you know be able to you know have some business uh, that we might not get if we only restricted the 300 people in, in the in the building for that day. Disappoint some people that would come in and didn't have tickets that didn't realize uh, that it was going to be a ticket event. Uh, but we can still accommodate them because it is a day when people walk in the front door, don't look at a simulcast screen, just have their bets for the Derby or the other graded races and go home and watch them on TV. So um, it will be a different Derby this year. And when I explained about it being springtime and the first Saturday in May, people like to get out. I mean, it's more of a party atmosphere here on Derby Day. So we're not expecting that, especially this year, where now it's not even the first leg of the Triple Crown. It's being run on the, you know, September, and people don't seem to be wanting to go out as much as they used to either. So, you know, we usually handle anywhere from 700 thousand dollars to a million dollars on derby day <clears throat> um, we don't expect to come anywhere close to that this year uh, if we did a quarter of a million to three hundred thousand i think we'd be ecstatic so um, but we're just looking for a way to accommodate people that come in that want to make a bet and that we could um, and that we could accommodate them if i could just uh, start with just two clarifications one uh, a little bit of a funny one steve uh, uh, the party atmosphere um, probably will be something that we 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 are sad that we can't really help you with that this year. Um, <laughs> uh, but with respect to the proposal that you're making, which is the drive up, as well as as I understand, basically you're going to have standing kiosks that folks would could walk in and and place their their bets almost like an ATM machine or a kiosk. Right. Um, the uh, the reason why uh, they they need to place the bets come to the premises is because while many of your traditional loyal um, bettors do have the proper account that actually allows for mobile betting in Massachusetts, most of the casual do not. But I just want to remind the public and, and all of us that there is mobile betting allowed um, from your home if you set up the established account, correct? Uh, sure. and, and and for horse racing, and and that's been around for a long, long time. And so in this case, you expect a crowd usually, it is a party atmosphere usually, we have a pandemic and you're trying to accommodate those who want to enjoy the, the um, experience of betting on Derby while watching from their home, they actually have to come to the premises to place their bet. Sure. So, Okay, so those are just to, to lay the land. Um, I'm sure there are many questions that you, um, we all have here. This is, a, this is a new event and hopefully it could well be just a one-time event. It, I know we're not expecting it for the future. Uh, doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Before we just continue, Todd, are there any legal requirements relevant to this discussion? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, there are a couple of legal issues that we looked at, um, and I'd be happy to walk through those now just to get them on the table. Um, the first question, uh, given that this is an atypical uh, request, was just whether the wagering devices can actually be positioned in the places they were being requested. Um, so we wanted to look at what 
what body of law governs that. And it turns out that it's governed by chapter 128A, section five, paragraph A. Um, and I think it's, it's worth, before I get into that, just a quick pause uh, to point out that this issue is not governed by chapter 23K, which allows for gaming to be conducted in the gaming establishment. The uh, parking lot area is not part of the gaming establishment, so there's been some question as to whether you could do this type of thing at all. But in my opinion, this is racing. This is, I mean, that's not my opinion. This is racing. Um, and so it's not gaming. There is a distinction between gaming activities and racing activities. Racing is clearly uh, governed by chapter 128A, and there is a specific body of law that addresses where uh, wagering machines can be placed. And as I said, that's section 5A. So um, the, the statute provides that before holding or conducting a racing meeting, every licensee shall provide a place or places equipped as here and after provided in the statute on the grounds where such meeting is held or conducted or adjacent thereto, but not elsewhere, um, at which the licensee shall conduct and supervise the paramutual uh, wagering, essentially. Um, so the requested positioning of these devices is clearly on the grounds where the racing meeting is being conducted. Um, so I don't see any issue under the statute with uh, placing the machines where they've been proposed, as I understand the proposal. There was a second issue that came up, though, um, that we did take a look at, um, and that is the type of machines themselves. And Section 5A also addresses that. Uh, that language says that essentially the place or places where they put the machines has to be equipped with automatic betting machines capable of accurate and speedy determination of awards or dividends uh, to winning patrons. And all such awards or dividends shall be calculated by a totalisator, uh, is that how you pronounce it, machine or like machine. I'm sure Steve can pronounce it better than me. But, um, Anyway, we've, we've been advised by PPC, Mr. O'Toole just mentioned that, and um, I think as Alex mentioned through the manufacturer itself, that these devices do have the capabilities required by statute, even if they won't be fully employed for these purposes. If pay, that is, if payouts won't actually be made in the parking lot. Um, and given that, they appear to me to comply with the statute. So with those two pieces in mind, it, it seems as though this proposal is in conformance with Section 5, uh, Paragraph A of Chapter 128. Questions on the overall plan? Uh, yes, um, I, I have a question um, that perhaps Steve can answer. Um, just, just um, the, the usual uh, teller environment, uh, a, a patron walks up um, to, to the teller and there's all kinds of information uh, like the odds for one, um, for one horse or another, um, that, that the, even the, the occasional that better might find um, uh, useful. Well, how is that uh, going to work in this in, in general? Uh, somebody who, um, who who will be um, forwarded to the to the to the outside um, booth, if you will. So the tellers, uh, wh when they're taking the bets, they will have what are called profile sheets for each track and each race, which is very very uh, uh, ordinary. It's kind of like the newspaper entries and results, just the entries, the jockey, and the morning line uh, odds. And whenever you're doing advanced wagering uh, like that, you're subject to the, uh, the odds at the time that the gate swings open. So um, if you're betting in the derby at three o'clock, uh, you're subject to the, the, the odds at post time, not the odds at three o'clock, and they, they swing around the whole, the whole day. They stay pretty close to the morning line odds, especially on the, on the race like the Kentucky Derby and the graded stakes races, because the, the, the track selections and the morning line odds are pretty hold true throughout the card. I mean, they vary, but they hold true throughout the, throughout the race day. So, um, the, and the casual better doesn't care. Um, if, uh, if Zuniga is in the race, 
you're going to come here and you're going to bet on Zuniga, right? <laughs> so that's that's what these casual bettors um, are, are more apt to do. They, a lot of them don't even care about the odds. They want to have the bragging rights back at home that, you know, grandpa picked the winner and, and the young and the young grandson did and stuff like that. Um, that's what we find. And we find actually educating a lot of the bettors when they, when they come in too. They, you know, they, they, they want to bet on the Derby, but they're not sure that some of the language they they understand win play show but not you know exact as super factors and things like that so um but we'll have that we'll have the morning line odds we'll have the profile sheets so if they want if they want to look at entries and stuff like that we can get that to them um and we do that on a regular basis uh, actually all the time here at, at, at plain ridge for anybody who um, needs to just make you know, learn how to bet okay um and also um you know, in general, uh, a car will approach, um, um, you know, the, the, the open parking area. I suppose somebody will be there to try to um, ascertain whether they're there for just a drive-through um, or whether they have a ticket and direct them accordingly. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, we have kind of a, we're not using the valet lot now. Uh, valet parking has been suspended so we're using the valet lot for uh, for that so we have a, uh, a swing around where we can take a substantial amount of cars and queue them in line to uh, to participate in this in this type of uh, unique type of wagering um, Greg might be able to answer more about how that traffic is going to flow um, but we you know through signage and directing them to that uh, lot um, it'll be pretty uh, it'll pretty, be pretty evident of, of how they get in line and get queued up for that. And we will have, uh, I believe Greg has uh, provided for uh, an officer out there to be directing traffic. Perhaps before we go into the details of the transportation, we should probably address uh, COVID-19 compliance um, <clears throat> in terms of, I understand that you'll have the folks who are taking the bets have proper uh, uh, face masks and face uh, protection what will you be? Um, what will be your communication to the actual uh, better when they drive up? Will they be needing to be masked? How are you going to uh, communicate the, the um, expectations of your patrons? Again, through signage, and we'll also, we're also going to have a supervisor and a Plainville police officer at, out there in the parking lot as well uh, to prepare uh, the customers as they as they get closer. And uh, I think I meant, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned signage, but signage, of course, while they're in line to prepare them for you know what, what's coming up. So our supervisors and the Plainville police officer will be there kind of monitoring the whole situation. So these activities are also all outside. And so um, Loretta, we haven't talked about that, but as they're coming in and queue, commissioners, would we expect them to keep their masks on despite the fact that or they'll, they'll be outside in the queue to bet at the kiosks, is that fair, Steve? They'll be in outside space. I imagine that would be just like entering the casino, where, where people line up to enter the casino and get uh, and come through a, a line. We'd, we'd ask them to be six feet apart and, and and conform with all with the mask on, conform with all the rules that we have uh, for that line set up as well. And if it if it goes into the outside space, they'll keep their masks on. They'll be in. Yeah, it's just the, the where we have the walk-ups is it, it, it's it's just a it's a small building, and there's a gate coming in and there's a gate going out, yeah. so it'll just be a, a, a right around the building. There'll be two tellers there, so we'll keep them moving, and um, so they'll be in they'll be in a line there, uh, but it'll be a moving line. They'll all be outside; they don't come inside at all. In that, in that that's circle. that's what I thought. So, um, Commissioner Cameron, I think you're nodding, but you understand what I'm saying. It's a little bit different because it'll be uh, outside. I do, and I, and I do think it's important as as they do now to to have the mask and six feet apart, and and it sounds like there's going to be someone there to remind people as well as signs to inform them of what the process is. I think that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with where they're doing this. I'm trying to think about so exactly. it's it's not, and I have seen this work in other jurisdictions. Um, you know the the outdoor, um, uh, you know the walkabouts. So I I I can visualize because I've seen it. Um, 
And they actually did, uh, sorry to inject, um, they, they actually just did this at the Meadowlands for Hamiltonian Day. Um, they had uh, they had these the walkabouts in the parking lot. They didn't do drive through like we're proposing. They did walk up with the walkabouts in the in in one of their parking lots there uh, to keep people outside the building. Commissioners, questions for Director O'Toole and Dr. Lightbound. Um, I, I, are we restricting it somewhat to the COVID and sort of the just the basic mechanics of the bedding? Because I do have questions about um, the comment that was made about even having done this outside, they didn't do driving. And that adds a whole other element to this in terms of security and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I know Dr. Lightbone and I have had some conversations about it. I've had some conversations with IB. Um, so I would like at some point to have a conversation about um, the forum under which we can really fully vet that part of this. But in terms of what we've talked about right now, um, in COVID in particular, I do think that instructing the patrons to have the mask on in the car also, because it would seem to me, you're not gonna be able to do six feet necessarily while you're engaging uh, the PPC employee who's taking it. So I do think in terms of requirements and then notice to the patrons, that even though they may feel like they're in a car and they can crack the window or something, I do think that in fairness to the person standing there taking the bet with the walkabout, that the patron should um, keep the mask on in that circumstance also to be just cautious. So let's just put the security question uh, because I think probably all of us are thinking about exactly the, 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 the transactions that are taking place. We'll just park that um, to the side and just concentrate the COVID right the second. Um, so we're hearing masks in the car, masks in the queues, whether they're inside or outside in maintaining social distance. Um, the actual, the folks who do stay, um, and I know that you've, you've, you are gonna be providing the tickets and you're imagining, Steve, that it will never, um, the number won't creep up to 300. The, the, uh, Loretta, I know that we've talked about this in terms of the um, number for, safe occupancy for spectators or simulcasters in this case. Um, is there a magic to 300? Is there a formula that supports that? Let's just say, Steve, you know, it's a great day. Everybody is completely in compliance with their masks, but at a certain point you do creep up to that 300. Are you able to maintain the social distancing that we need to accomplish to, to make sure that people can enjoy themselves, but be safe. Uh, Al uh, Loretta, uh, sorry. So it, it's my understanding that the 300, the tickets to be distributed for the 300 are for entry uh, into the indoor and the apron area to enjoy uh, the event. Uh, the outdoor apron area is now a standing room only uh, area, uh, standing area. Uh, that, that's not the right language. Standing room only uh, implicates that it's, um, you know, very compressed standing. It is an area where there are no seats any longer. Uh, there had been a total of, I think, 54 seats. Uh, that uh, Those seats uh, have been cordoned off now. So the apron area uh, is a standing area only now. And the 300 uh, number uh, would be distributed between that apron area and the indoor uh, simulcast area. Uh, by uh, all calculations, uh, enforcing the six foot distancing for groups not traveling together would be uh, eminently doable between those two areas at the 300 uh, number. And uh, the additional measures of masks uh, would apply and beverage limitations to the indoor area only because beverages are limited to seating uh, areas only and there is no seating in the outdoor uh, area now. Um, also mindful, we talked earlier about the, the party atmosphere uh, being uh, minimized uh, because of uh, beverages and limitations on uh, occupancy numbers. 
uh, but also mindful that spectators enjoying this event uh, can be differentiated uh, from the behavior of uh, party goers at your you know typical social gathering uh, you would not expect the type of social interaction between guests who are not traveling together that you would uh, at a uh, uh, at a party for instance uh, attention is typically drawn to the either live or um, or to the uh, live event or, or to the screens. So in terms of that 300 number before, between the indoor and outdoor areas and with the six foot distancing, the masks, the limits on uh, beverages, the overall enhanced sanitation and availability of uh, hand sanitizers, as well as the experience with the recent um, Spirit of Massachusetts event, which also was a ticketed event. Uh, 300 tickets were made available. 250 attended uh, is my understanding. Um, the measures uh, do appear to be uh, enforceable uh, at the upcoming uh, September 5th event. Very helpful. Further questions? Just on that. Um, I, have, I had conversations with Loretta Lilius about that topic also, and um, I do believe my memory from the spirit of Massachusetts is they also had a detail officer there to assist in terms of the capacity and the distancing, et cetera. I'm just looking for confirmation that that's the same intention for this weekend. Uh, we have a detail officer for every live uh, racing day. Uh, this particular day, we're putting on an additional officer to assist with the uh, drive-through. So we'll still have we'll still have the officer in the building. So the officer in the building for the racing and the open apron area, and then one over in terms of traffic direction outside. Correct. And if I can make a comment for security in for this for Plain Ridge, uh, we have met with local first responders on August 21st. Went over our detailed traffic plan in the setup uh, for these two locations if approved. We will have all the security management and security officers uh, working in that area outside and racing and levels of uh, Plain Ridge uh, management throughout the facility as well. Uh, one, enforcing COVID-19 protocols and helping with any customer service uh, inquiries. Do we have um, other questions that are COVID-19 relevant, you know, related to the uh, sure, Commissioner Madam, Stevens? Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Steve, I think you touched on this earlier about, you know, again, I love advanced communication plans. So everybody has an expectation of what's going to happen when they show up. Uh, uh, probably similar to indoor betting or typical betting, I go up to somebody with a walkabout, I make my wager. Is there uh, an effort on the part of the person taking the wager to say, check your ticket before you drive away, just so that doesn't cause or create any kind of confusion? Um, I know myself trying to order through double D drive through. Sometimes I wind up with my order, sometimes I don't, depending on whether I have my mask up. But um, can you talk about that? Uh, just a little bit to make sure we're not causing any more confusion out on the uh, in the queue as people are coming up to make their bets. Sure, that's a that's a, actually a great point, uh, Commissioner. Um, one of the one of the uh, hurdles on a day like that is the uh, you know the the, the casual uh, gambler on on racing isn't first in all the language, so there's an there's always an added effort on that particular day and other days like that where there's high volume with inexperienced uh, gamblers on racing to check your ticket, be sure that's what you want. Um, a lot of different questions like that by our tellers because uh, they, they, they don't like to make mistakes. And uh, when and they take, they take a little bit extra effort in that day because they realize uh, exactly what they're dealing with. Um, our tellers uh, know the experienced betters that stand in line and they know that they know all the risks uh, of, of gambling but when they see unfamiliar faces even on a, even on a normal day 
they'll they'll make sure. And we have we do have signage, and we'll have signage for uh, check your tickets before before departing because that is that is the case in racing. Once you walk away with your ticket, it's yours, and for obvious reasons, you can't come back after the race is over and say I really want it. So they get to win and not uh, step it. <laughs> <laughs> I um, really, I want to know if there's a horse name like that. <laughs> you know, I would like to add to, uh, we will be working with our marketing department for advanced communication for as our traffic plan, our COVID-19 protocols, and any race and uh, other details. So we will have that out, sent out with our marketing department here uh, soon once we get the approval. And I'm, I'm assuming Greg and, and Steve, in addition to a mask and a shield and any plexiglass, that you know, they also have gloves to be able to, you know, it's accepting cash from from the driver as they go about their work. But I'm assuming that's um, already included, just yes. hasn't been discussed. Yes, all yes, the uh, the san hand sanitizers, the gloves, the uh, and obviously outside uh, the shields as well as the face mask. Okay, thank you. So, in terms of the um, COVID-19 uh, related matters, um, I, I would make the suggestion to Steve that you just work closely with um, our, um, with Loretta Leos and team to just make sure that you know, the standards that are incorporated, that we've already gone over and adopted, are being met and that we're anticipating if we haven't mentioned it today, because this is a new plan to us, um, that we, uh, if we need to actually do anything formal, we could always reconvene, but that you could work with her to make sure that the intent of our standards adopted for racing are also being applied here and for simulcasting. And to the extent that it implicates the casino at all, we have to make sure we're consistent with those too. Absolutely. Um, I, yeah, I think if we could just uh, agree to make sure you collaborate closely with, uh, does that make sense, Lorella, at least with COVID? Absolutely. And Steve and I have been uh, in touch and uh, uh, I met him on site a couple weeks ago uh, down in Plain Ridge so uh, we can coordinate and uh, collaborate on the measures uh, for the event on the 5th. Okay. All right, now in terms of security, uh, it's a couple of a couple of outstanding issues. I would think that we want to make sure we don't leave without addressing uh, security and also just the gaming integrity. Um, <clears throat> we've mentioned the statutory requirement with respect to the equipment. Um, I think, you know, given what I've heard, there should be no problem um, with that, but I think it would make, uh, it's a good, uh, a best practice to have that reflected in writing. Um, Todd, that should not be um, problematic, I don't think, in terms of the, that the uh, company has seen the statutory requirements, I suspect. They, uh, they were sent over, but we can, we'll circle back to make sure they're very clear on that. Okay, and then in terms of um, any other gaming integrity issues um, I, and security issues, I think that there um, it becomes, of course, problematic to discuss security issues in public. I believe that there may be some relief that we can get from um, the through the open meeting law with respect to an executive session if we feel a need to address security and security strategies for this particular um, event um, more privately. Karen um, and Todd, I'm not sure I wanna offer, I wanna make sure we can offer something to the commissioners that's, that's uh, truly available. Yeah, and Todd and I were in touch last night and this morning on that, and uh, there is an exception under the uh, open meeting law uh, for public safety and security, and this this would fall into that exception. Do you agree with that, Todd? That's right. It's uh, so it's Chapter 30A, Section 21, which talks about executive sessions and outlines all the reasons why a body can go into executive section a session. Uh, and Part Four says that a body can go into executive session 
uh, to discuss the deployment of security personnel or devices or strategies with respect thereto. And that seems to fit squarely within what the commission is interested in talking about uh, here. So I do believe you can make use of the executive session provisions of the open meeting law um, if that would be helpful. Commissioner O'Brien, you mentioned that you had some um, security questions. Would that be I, helpful to you? I did, it would be helpful to me. I think if, well, we can resolve integrity of the game and the request itself at the open meeting, I do think that um, being able to candidly have that conversation because this is a new event outside. Um, and even in New Jersey, we didn't have moving vehicles, et cetera. So I do have security questions that I think it's not appropriate. Um, to discuss it would defeat the purpose to discuss in this venue, but I think if we can in short order um, Resolve that by executive session that that would be the way to go Other commissioners comment I do want to recognize that um, Lieutenant Gibbons is on uh, he's joined today. So good morning um, He would also be uh, part of the equation. I suspect uh, providing um, uh, security as the our MSP representative at um, MGM, but uh, perhaps you'd be working and being informed on this. So thank you for at least joining today, whether you're the, the part of the equation or the messenger today. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, other commissioners, do you feel that you would like to explore uh, these, the security measures um, through an executive session, just so that we are quite aware of, of both the risks and the um, the uh, the plan. I, I would I, th I would agree with that. I think we should use the opportunity to use the uh, executive session if it's available to us to talk about some of those security concerns. I don't think it's a long list, but. It's certainly one that warrants having a conversation uh, where that information can be kept confidential. Commissioner Cameron? Yeah, I would agree. I um, I actually love to talk about security plans. So <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> so I, I, I would uh, welcome the opportunity as well. Okay, and Commissioner Seneca? Uh, yes, uh, you know, just to complete uh, the concern or, um, the, you know, um, the, the, the feeling of the majority. I, I, I do uh, recognize that our staff has looked at um, a lot of the details, and I know understandably that we cannot necessarily go through them uh, here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied that, uh, that they have things um, thought through, but um, you know, I'll, I'll go along with, um, with joining um, an executive session and, 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 yeah. and hearing I those questions um, that, that others may have. I agree. We we certainly have some background, but what we haven't been able to do is hear each other's questions. And I and I know that you know many of our own questions will be really helpful to hear and answer. And and I know uh, Director O'Toole that your team would uh, be able to um, you know keep us fully informed. So in in order to um, go into an executive session, that has to be noticed appropriately. So we can take measures to notice that it will be probably treat it as um, an emergency uh, uh, hearing just so that we can allow you the proper time to move forward with respect to the security issue. With that said, um, with respect to the plan today, we could, um, I think, Karen, act on the plan as presented with an exception to you know, further review of the security. Um, That's correct, yes. And, uh, and I think, and I think also some further clarification, just to to um, make sure that we're all set with respect to the um, the gaming um, integrity through the device. So, but that we can take care of. That that I'm I don't yeah. think we need to make an yeah. exception. It would just be uh, right. something that I would ask staff to take care of. Correct. Correct. I think that's the efficient way to do it. And um, before we move on, if we were to separate out the security, uh, if we were to, is there anything else with respect to COVID-19? We've obviously deferred also to having Loretta work closely 
Lord and team, of course, work closely with, with Steve. Anything else that you can think of with respect to this plan? Okay. So you do need, uh, I'm back to Dr. Lightbound. You do um, want us to take uh, formal action today. Yes, that would be great on the uh, two issues that you talked about, if you're comfortable with them. So with respect to um, my going forward and marking up a notice for the um, emergency executive session, do we, I don't know if we need formal action on that, but I have a consensus that we could move forward because you'd have to vote to go into executive session um, uh, under uh, the law. But I can go ahead and move on that. You won't be surprised. All right, excellent. Second, um, with respect to the, the substantive uh, request from PPC on the plan for the, the Derby Day. Do I have a motion if we were to segregate security issues? Um, uh, that do, I'm sorry. Michelle O'Brien, uh, do you I was gonna amend, um, Madam Chair, I move the commission approve the use of handheld wagering devices or walkabouts during the uh, 2020 Kentucky Derby Day pursuant to compliance with the existing racing and gaming COVID restrictions and any additional COVID restrictions discussed today and further subject to IEB confirming the statutory compliance of the device and subject to approval of any security issues to be discussed um, at the executive session, at, a, at, a, at an executive session. Second. <clears throat> any discussion? Commissioner Zuniga, Commissioner Stebbin? Okay. Okay. No further questions, edits. Then we'll, we'll go ahead with the roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And Commissioner Stebbin? Aye. Okay, I vote yes, 5 0. Director O'Toole, you've got some good marching orders. We, um, um, we'll be reconvening um, in an executive session and uh, Karen and team will work with, with you to see who we would like to enjoy to join that session. So thank you very much. Uh, thank, Lisa, thank, thank you. And, thank you, and Lisa Chair. and Greg, we thank you for being here. I'm sorry. Thank you. Th thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the commissioners for uh, taking the time to hear this and the staff's work. It's really appreciated. And Lisa and Greg have done a lot of work to help me as well. So I, I appreciate their help. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for uh, joining us this morning. Okay. Dr. Lightman, are you all set? We are. Thank you very much. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Then we can move back to uh, Todd's favorite subject. Um, we're on to regulations, item number six on the agenda. Thank you. Um, so the, the first one is uh, are certain amendments to 205 CMR 134.03. Uh, you'll recall these amendments were um, enacted by emergency in order to allow employees of licensee sister properties to work uh, on site during the reopening period on a temporary and limited basis provided proper notices uh, are provided uh, to the commission. Uh, these amendments were to an already existing uh, scheme that was put in place to allow for uh, such employment during uh, the initial opening of the casino. And uh, the amendments really just allow those to also take place during the reopening uh, of a casino uh, to address the pandemic uh, situation we find ourselves in. So as I said, these uh, have been in effect by emergency. They have gone through the promulgation process. There was a public hearing conducted this morning overseen by Commissioner Stebbins, as he described uh, earlier. Um, and we have uh, an amended a small business impact statement before you, and they are uh, teed up for final adoption if you are so inclined. Commissioner Stebbins, any comments this morning on this particular reg? No, as, uh, as I pointed out before, we had the, the public hearing. There were no comments, uh, but I think as Councilor, Councilor, General Counsel Grossman pointed out, uh, this was part of the regs teed up for the opening. Uh, none of us ever expected to have suspension of operations, but 
we saw our licensees needing to bring in some back in some key team members to help with the reopening uh, after the suspension. And keep in mind that most of those folks are upper level management and uh, are already licensed or likely approved uh, registrants in another gaming jurisdiction. So um, I, I think it's, it's it's a helpful tweak to the uh, the regulations. Hopefully, we won't have to go through it again. Uh, but it uh, it certainly gives our licensees some great flexibility to get some key team members in for uh, some of the critical steps that needed to take place before they could reopen. So I think it's very smart and it's great to incorporate it finally. So back to General Counsel Grossman. So we'd be uh, seeking two votes here today, one for the amended small business impact statement and one for uh, the vote to finalize the promulgation process. Any questions uh, for Todd? Sorry. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Stebbins. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 134.03, gaming service employees as included in the Commissioner's packet. Second. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, um, we'll call Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes. 5-0, Shara. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd further move the commission adopt the version of 205 CMR 134.03 gaming service employees as included in the commissioner's packet and authorize the staff to take all necessary steps to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Do I have a second? second? Commissioner O'Brien, okay, thank you. Um, any further questions? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, five zero, thank you. Moving on to 6B. So these are, um, amendments to uh, 205 CMR 138.72. I'd like to turn this part of the presentation over to attorney uh, Teresi, who has uh, joined us by video um, for the presentation. Yes, hi, thank you, General Counsel Grossman. And uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. You have in your packet a draft of 205 CMR 138.72. This regulation requires the gaming licensees to have a system of internal controls that includes policies and procedures relative to ensuring a workplace free from unlawful discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. Uh, this regulation came before the commission on June 4th, and at that time you voted to begin the promulgation process. There was a public hearing held this morning to receive comments, uh, as you've discussed already, that was presided over by Commissioner Stebbins, and we did not receive any comments at that time. Um, we did, however, receive comments from MGM uh, prior to the hearing this morning, and you have a red line in your packet that reflects those comments. So I want to be clear that the red line, uh, the changes in the, in the draft in your packet are not proposals from the legal department. Those are um, the comments that we received from MGM. I incorporated them into the draft so that you could see how they would look in the document and have an opportunity to discuss them today. Um, so there are two changes. Um, that you'll see in section one and four F that are really just clerical changes that MGM proposed. Um, there, are, there are, however, two comments in section four D and four G that are more substantive. So the comment in section four D, um, that removes language that would require an explanation when uh, the licensee identifies certain allegations um, as not having been investigated or resolved. And section 4G removes the requirement that qualifications be provided for anyone who will be conducting training on unlawful discrimination, harassment, or retaliation, and instead um, requires only that their title be provided. So with respect to these two substantive changes, um, we do have some concerns. So um, I'm going to turn it over so, to you. 
Oh, yes. I just kind of, I'm sorry, uh, Carrie, I do need a clarifier. So yeah. the red lines that are in here right now came in from MGM. When? Yes. Uh, after the, after June, the first time they came before the commission. Um, so okay. they were comments received as part of the promulgation process. Okay. And then we have not received any further comments from the general public. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. So these are not your recommended changes. This is not, this is um, MGM's recommended changes and not necessarily Encore or PPCs. That's right. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, so I think Commissioner O'Brien uh, was going to begin the discussion on what some of the concerns are with the, the two uh, more substantive changes that I identified. Certainly. Thank you, Attorney Teresi. Um, Carrie and I went over these um, when they came in and we've had a discussion and I did, in my view, see D and G as being substantive. I see sort of the, the other two as some sort of ministerial change that don't substantively change the requirements of the reg. My um, concern with D is my memory of why that language that they're suggesting be stricken was in there in the circumstance where you may have one or more cases that simply do not move and maybe are stale. And there would be some reason we would be looking for why they're not. It could be tracking an EOC matter. It could be maybe tracking a grand jury matter, something like that. There might be valid reasons why a case would sit. Um, I'm a little stumped by the request because to me, that requirement almost would help them explain a lack of movement on certain cases. So I, I'm a little flummoxed as to why they would ask for the deletion. Um, and then as for G, um, the qualifications request was in there in particular, so we knew that these trainings were not simply checking a box and that it was going to be conducted by someone with expertise in the area. And so I, I am particularly concerned about the G request and don't think it's appropriate because while the title is somewhat helpful, I don't want a title thrown on someone who, and then we have no idea whether they were truly qualified to give what is an important training. So those are my thoughts on um, the proposed changes. Uh, if I could add to that, I, I clearly remember also why we included those um, uh, in, in our meetings with the licensees. We discussed all of these items and um, kind of had dialogue back and forth on why these provisions were important. Um, and there was general agreement with, with everyone there at the meeting that this, this made sense. Um, so I, my recollection is the same as yours, Commissioner, and I agree with you that um, D and G should remain as uh, originally written. Um, uh, there is a reason for both of those, uh, uh, both of those, both the qualifications and the explanation to be included. And there was substantive discussion about it. I don't know if anyone has any other comments or questions, but my recommendation would be to not incorporate the red lines um, unless the ministerial ones are, you know, by preference um, adopted um, and just go forward with the non red line version that we had voted on the last time. With yeah, respect to the, uh, I'm sorry, with respect to the others, or is there any, um, is there any clarification that you thought was beneficial? Um, I didn't, not necessarily, other than it, um, the first request in terms of incorporating by reference might be not having to create a freestanding document, although I don't know. I believe Attorney Tracy asked for some further clarification on that, um, uh, and I don't believe you got any, Carrie. Maybe I'm wrong. The last time we spoke, you hadn't gotten further clarification on that. I haven't, no. Well, the, the, the first one is it, an or, so it's, you know, it, um, I don't think it hurts, the, you know, on, on number one in terms of incorporating that uh, what appears to be very minor. As long as it's um, accessible. My fear is that it's not a, I don't want it to be a document that's at headquarters that's then a trouble to find for someone. Uh, that was my hesitancy with that. Oh, so fair as long enough. as that's accurate, okay, but I, I, we didn't get clarification on what they meant, so that's why I'm hesitant to adopt it. I see. Well, on the substantive ones, um, I, I agree with your recommendation, Commissioner O'Brien, that we don't adopt the, the comments provided because they change what I think is ultimately um, an important piece. Um, you know, 
that actually helps them, as as, uh, um, as you suggest on, on D, but also um, that is important on in the case of, of, of the subsections G. Commissioner Stevens, yeah. I think I interrupted you before. Sorry. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, yeah, and with respect to to G, um, I'm assuming for the most part, some of this training might be done by somebody who's outside the organization, and they would easily be able to provide a list of their qualifications, their resume, their background, especially if they were pitching any sort of uh, training work. Uh, to our licensees. So I, I, I really didn't see that as a big heavy lift. Um, that's information that's probably readily available and, and probably more helpful than just a person's title. It does app offer some, um, a little bit of clarification? Arguably, I'm agnostic on F. I think Karen and I talked about that. It, it might um, provide some. Yeah, it seems that the change in F is um, fairly innocuous. Just I it's and recently, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think F would be uh, would be appropriate to include. It does clarify a little bit exactly what policy we're talking about. Right. I'm in agreement with respect to um, G and D. And because I really can't get my head wrapped around um, what they're, they're going for in, with the OR clause, or incorporate by reference existing corporate policies, a system and term submitted by a game shall include policies or incorporate by reference existing corporate policies. Okay. I'm, yeah, and the fact that they didn't clarify when we asked yeah. them to. Yeah, uh, I'm a little, yeah, I'm a little lost exactly. as to what it means. So um, yeah. I, I would just say maybe F looks like a helpful clarifier. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you need to have formal action taken on this, or do uh, we need to go back to them on this? What would you recommend, Carrie? No, we don't need to go back. Um, so we, uh, you have in your packet an amended small business impact statement um, as well. So we can um, take action on that as well as action on the regulation and just um, accept the version in the packet um, with the exception of the three changes that we won't be accepting or in the alternative, um, accept the changes, the version in the packet with the change only to um, F, I believe it is. Commissioners, yeah, are we, is someone ready to take action on this, or do we um, still have some more questions? I can give you a motion if, unless there are questions. No, I'll set. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 138.72 policies and procedures for ensuring a workplace free from unlawful discrimination, harassment, and retaliation, as included in the commissioner's packet only including the red line represented in paragraph 4F. Second. Questions, edits? Okay. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zinnica? Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. I vote yes. Five zeros, Shara. Um, Madam Chair, I further move that the Commission adopt the version of 205 CMR 138.72 policies and procedures for ensuring a workplace free from unlawful discrimination, harassment, and retaliation, as included in the Commissioner's packet, um, only including the red lines represented in 4F, and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any Further questions? I'll start Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, five zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, and, and Carrie noted it was good afternoon. We are moving into the, um, the afternoon hours. Um, our next item is Number seven, back to you, Karen, for the uh, compliance items update. Yes, so you know, I think this is part of an ongoing discussion. You know, uh, compliance is, is 
uh, overall is central to our function as a regulatory agency. And we have many components of that throughout our operations. So I think it makes sense for an ongoing discussion. Uh, but it, I thought it would be helpful to give sort of that broad overview of things we've got going on with compliance uh, across the agency. Uh, you know, and I am certainly open to any feedback, suggestions. It's, you know, it's a, it's a core part of our function. So uh, any kind of uh, information or best practices on any areas of compliance would certainly make us a better agency. So for purposes of the update this afternoon, I'll group them into two buckets. So I'll talk about external compliance and our external compliance functions and our internal compliance functions. So these are just examples of things we do throughout the agency. Uh, with respect to external compliance, a, a major component is our gaming agents division. So these are our individuals that serve as on-site on compliance officers, officers, and they have a focus on compliance with casino internal controls, as well as other things. You saw earlier today, they did a ton of work with respect to the party at the um, at, at the Encore Boston Harbor, but a lot of their uh, work deals with internal controls, with the cage, with the um, dealers and how they deal their cards, uh, you know, all sorts of gaming integrity operations and operations that uh, ensure safety and uh, security at the, at the property, as well as public confidence in the integrity of the games at the casinos. So that's a huge component, and as, as I mentioned, it is a 24-7 operation. So we are constantly doing external compliance all day, every day, while these casinos are open. Uh, uh, sort of a, a part or subset of that is through our IT technical compliance group, the IT department, you know, uh, ensuring technical compliance of the electronic gaming machines with established standards. So, you know, that whole team working to make sure that the public can have confidence that when they put money into a uh, slot machine at one of the casinos, that the odds are fair and they're in compliance with the regulations and with appropriate standards. Um, in addition, we've got, uh, for example, Joe Delaney working um, with the licensee um, these and their license conditions and their commitments to the, not only the states, the state, but individual communities. So their host community agreements, their surrounding community agreements, there's compliance with respect to that. Uh, we also have Jill uh, working with uh, compliance with respect to diversity and workforce development and suppliers and keeping track of that. Um, we have Derek and Paul. They work on the casino audit. So the uh, annual audit required at the casinos, uh, they do work with Eve Bailey on that whole process. And uh, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into that and a lot of thought uh, every year on all those uh, operations. And overall, our legal department is supporting all of this. So uh, given that we are a regulatory agency, obviously we deal with compliance on a regular basis uh, for our external parties. Um, as far as internal compliance, uh, we have uh, for years, we have had a risk assessment process within the agency. Uh, through that process, we identify risks in each department and identify uh, remedial measures to mitigate those risks. So we have an internal audit and compliance working group, and we have Commissioner Zuniga um, works on that, as well as Commissioner O'Brien and a number of our top-level staff. Um, currently, that we're working on the charter and the scope of responsibility and what, what is that group doing. But for years, they've been going over these identified risks to talk about them and see you know, what should we be doing and how can we make things uh, better at the agency. Um, other internal components of compliance include your C, you know, our CIO, uh, the security, protection of information, our CFO, uh, policies and procedures to ensure compliance with state requirements and best, pra best practices to protect funds. Anytime you're dealing with money, there always has to be uh, protections and procedures in place. Uh, HR department, protection of confidential and protected information. Um, we're subject to the state auditor's office. You know, we have been audited and we can be audited by the state auditor's office uh, at their discretion. Uh, at another meeting, I also identified and, and discussed a little bit the uh, internal control plan that we have and the internal control questionnaire, the annual one that we have filled out. 
So we're doing a lot of, of these things on an internal basis as well. Uh, one of the next steps we're talking about is what is the best way to test internal compliance? So we're having a discussion on that, doing research. Uh, for example, what is the law and the best practices you know, an internal control officer? How do we want to do that? How do we want to make sure that we're doing what we need to be doing? And I think as an agency, being open uh, to being tested, to being checked, to having each other look at things is a healthy environment so that we can be uh, open and available to making changes if necessary. You don't have to be the agency that does things just because that's how we always did it. If there are better options or ways that things can be improved, uh, it's helpful for the agency to have that mindset. Um, so I just wanted to give an overview. I don't know any commissioners have any questions, comments, thoughts on compliance, uh, anything they'd like me to be doing as the interim executive director, anything I can direct uh, towards the staff, but you know, this is an, an ongoing issue and to be a, a premier agency and to do things well, compliance, both internal and external, has to be part of that conversation. So um, I'm certainly open to any suggestions, any direction from the commission on how uh, you'd like to move this forward and, and, and further discussion, any other further topics, how we want to discuss this going forward, I'd, I'd be welcoming uh, to any suggestions in that area. Thank you, Karen. This is a really um, a helpful start to planning that has been going on and then perhaps formalizing the plan so that we would be able to, to move and, and be able to be strategic going forward. Commissioner Zuniga and Commissioner O'Brien, you both have been involved in, in the, um, the regular working group. Commissioner Zuniga? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, just to, um, I, I think that's a great overview uh, that, that Karen uh, provides. Uh, 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 the, the central uh, idea, um, I think, is, is one that deserves more highlighting. Um, not that she didn't do a good job highlighting it, but is that the work is ongoing. We have this working group um, that has developed a lot of, um, you know, a monthly meeting to thinking about um, what areas need to be uh, assessed, what uh, um, uh, a calendar that we have in terms of our own compliance, a risk assessment that's, um, that's done annually, um, uh, and, and other things uh, as well. So um, I think we, we are in the process of, of um, establishing a, um, a, what, we, what we're calling a charter documenting a charter uh, as to what are the roles and responsibilities of that uh, group, who is part of that group. Um, we always assume that uh, we will be coming to this commission to update on those, um, uh, those efforts, um, because it's important to, at a minimum, at a summary level for the rest of the commissioners, not just those that participate in that group, to understand uh, some of those details. And as Karen alluded to, um, this is something that we uh, plan on reporting back on a regular basis. Um, one particular aspect that I just want to put out there as something we ought to think about for, um, you know, for a future meeting um, is um, one uh, of the roles of, um, that are a best practice of the comptroller, and that is a designation of the internal controls um, officer. Um, it was, if I, if I may just provide a brief um, sort of history of that, uh, because, it's, because it's a, um, a guideline from uh, a comptroller, um, the, the finance department is usually the one uh, following a lot of the guidelines that the comptrollers puts out. Um, and in this particular case, um, the, our history with that role has fallen on uh, the finance department, um, just in terms of complying with, uh, with making the risk assessment. But somebody going to each of the directors and saying, what are the risks and documenting them and saying, you know, uh, documenting how they're being mitigated or what become priority. Um, technically, that is not the ideal uh, person, somebody who's in the finance department, to be doing, uh, to be uh, acting in that role. So one of the things that I want to come back to this commission with is eventually uh, decide on and designate somebody 
Um, and there will be pros and cons as to depending on what that, where that person sits um, for that role. That's one of the things that uh, I, I, I was hoping that we would discuss um, um, you know, uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, it is really not critical, um, really in, in, in terms of um, timing. Um, that is something that we need to think about for at a minimum when we do the next uh, internal risk assessment. Um, but it's something that was highlighted recently um, and something that we need to think about uh, and is this designated, that role is designated by the, the head of the agency. And because a lot of us are the head of the agency, we need to think about what, uh, when and how that designation is eventually. Well, with respect to the head of the agency, I think that um, that's been clarified. With respect to the internal, you're talking about the internal control officer right now, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the internal control uh, officer and this uh, controller guideline yeah. is designated by, by the head of the agency. Right. Uh, we could make an argument, and, and, and I think we should consult with the controller on this, on this matter as to whether that guideline fits squarely with our own um, structure. We are a, a, an atypical agency in the sense of um, we have a five member full-time commission. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of that guideline is really thought, thought of for agencies with one secretary or one commissioner. And that person, in many, in most instances, designates that internal control officer. But I don't want to necessarily talk too much about that position. That's one thing that I think we need to talk about. Uh, but the, the report that, um, uh, that Karen uh, says, it's an important one, that, uh, and, and that is that we will continue to come with updates and reports about these efforts as, as we continue forward. Yeah, it's a very important exercise. Um, and so thank you, uh, Enrique, for starting the conversation. I think that we want to, uh, you know, continue to get some good guidance from the outside. I do think as much as that there are two commissioners involved in the compliance discussion, a compliance is something, one, that belongs very much, as Karen has noted, as part of the core mission of operations, and so very much falls on to the executive director's oversight. And then as a commission, we do all need to be fully informed on an ongoing basis with respect to um, compliance issues as they arise. So um, well, that's why the planning is so important and these are good initial steps. So thank you. And you've been doing a lot of work that just needs to be now trans translated to, to all five of us. So thank you. Commissioner O'Brien, you've also been involved in those discussions. I don't know if you wanna add in at this point. Uh, no, other than to say that um we're at a transition point, and I know we all joke that there's no such thing as steady state, but there was one main focus. There was an element of compliance in terms of licensing and, and that and construction. We are in a different phase with all but one region at this point. And so we as an agency also have to take a look at what that means going forward. And that is part of the discussion that we have in the group in terms of what's this gonna look like in terms of, um, audit and compliance functions for the office going forward and it we need to, it's a good time to assess um, given the fact that we have shifted to the three functioning casinos albeit a strange time because we're not under um, the new normal um, but it is a it's a, a backdrop to everything that Karen and Enrique have spoken about questions Commissioner Cameron Commissioner Stebbins no questions. Thank you for the thoughtful um, explanation and meat on the bones with what, what the group is doing. I echo that. Good work. Excellent. So we'll just stay tuned for the, um, and make sure that we have appropriate amount of time and preparation to, to make it a, a meaningful discussion. Make sure that all of us are kind of apprised as to the, um, the subject matter. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Zunica, um, if you have, if we are getting a little short on time, but I think our report is relatively straightforward. You want to start? 
Yes, are we on um, the item? Uh, number eight, number, number eight. eight. Yes. yes, on the executive director um, yes. search update. Yeah, um, and um, let me just start by, um, by noting that um, we conducted a, two surveys, uh, you might remember, of, um, of the staff and directors uh, relative to um, attributes, qualities, uh, priorities um, for the agency, but also in the context of um, the executive director um, uh, search, uh, and, and in particular, our interim executive director, uh, Karen. Um, we've distributed that, you know, HR has distributed that, uh, the results of those uh, surveys to commissioners uh, only, you should have received those. Um, I will only uh, note that it's perhaps not surprising that there is great feedback uh, and, and really altogether positive um, uh, from, uh, of Karen. Um, and uh, we come here uh, today to figure out essentially next steps. What we had uh, talked about in our efforts uh, most recently was that um, as these two surveys would inform, would help us inform uh, the next steps on, on designating uh, uh, the, the permanent executive director. And uh, we have, I suppose, a couple of options, and that's what I want to bring up uh, today. Whether we decide on, on one option or another today, that may be a different matter, but I wanted to put together, to put forward, um, the, the notion of uh, exactly how to continue the process. So um, you might recall that early on, we, um, we thought uh, that uh, a third uh, um, company, an outside company was gonna help us do these surveys. Uh, we've done that internally to, in my opinion, great success. And that those surveys would inform um, uh, a process for uh, determining that uh, uh, that next step. So we could take these um, these surveys, um, share them with Karen. Um, uh, eventually, we haven't done that yet. And then, uh, after doing that, uh, figure out a future uh, meeting, uh, a public meeting that we uh, come uh, uh, five commissioners and, and Karen and have a discussion not unlike uh, an interview that we've done uh, in the past. That could be um, as an option one, it could be an unstructured, just free flow conversation uh, in which uh, like in the past, each one of us uh, asks questions, um, uh, outlines priorities and gives feedback as, as, as we see uh, necessary. And uh, we know that, uh, uh, you know, Karen can, uh, you know, respond, um, take notes and, and what have you. As a second uh, option, um, we could have more of a structure uh, for that type of conversation and uh, provide something uh, akin to an evaluation, to a performance evaluation uh, in writing prior to that conversation in a public uh, meeting. That um, would generally be around the same uh, type of um, principles that I just described, the notion of trying to articulate priorities, uh, trying to provide uh, uh, good feedback as to what we've seen and what we expect uh, going forward as, as a way to, um, to guide uh, what is effectively a a, uh, an interview for the permanent uh, position. This, um, this second option brings up um, something that uh, the chair has highlighted as to who would be in the role, has highlighted to me, we've had a conversation, me and her about this, um, who would be in a position to uh, compile and aggregate those, uh, those comments. And, um, that, and that is something that in the past, we avail ourselves of the general counsel to um, each, um, each commissioner forwards um, uh, feedback, answers to questions uh, uh, and priorities and the like, 
and um, uh, the general counsel aggregates them into a document that is then mailed, made available to Karen and the public, and uh, and we have that uh, that discussion. That could also be done by uh, our outside counsel um, in case um, uh, we, we so benefit in, in doing that um, that process that way. Uh, so as a, a version of this, or a second version of this, um, this type of process um, would be a full evaluation um, of, like we've done, uh, like we did most recently when, um, when we did that for, um, for Ed Petrosian, in which we avail ourselves of uh, the evaluation form where we answer specific questions and, um, and do that uh, process or do that conversation in the context of evaluating Karen on the performance for the time that she's been an executive, an interim executive director. So um, those are in general the options uh, we have. Again, all three have uh, the purpose or objective of having uh, an open meeting, uh, open conversation, one that could be a little bit more structured in the form of a uh, formal um, uh, performance evaluation, somewhere in the middle where it's only a document that is aggregated or something uh, a lot more informal in terms of a free flow of conversation. But all three options, we have the goal of eliciting the, the, the discussion that outlines, again, priorities and feedback um, and uh, with, with, the, um, with the following outcome of having a discussion among commissioners um, to um, whether to offer uh, the permanent position to Karen and to have uh, discussions around compensation, which is, which is what would naturally follow, um, follow in terms of process. So I can stop there to see if I've articulated the options uh, sufficiently um, or answer any questions that anybody might have. Questions? Uh, <clears throat> I think I just heard an echo. Commissioner Cameron, Commissioner Stevens, Commissioner O'Brien, I think the bottom line is that we um, anticipate moving on this sooner than later. Uh, we think it's in the interest of the organization so that if we do advance Karen, uh, she can get going on some of the more uh, complex matters, particularly with respect to the um, org, org chart, which is really something that she um, would address only if in you know in the permanent or the the um, the executive rather than the interim um, status. Uh, so my hope is that with the feedback that we've received through the surveys and you're um, you know you you have that now that we could um, for all practical purposes now make this an interview of um, the leading candidate that we've all determined to be the leading candidate and, and, and do it in the proper venue um, because we must operate publicly with respect to the hire of the executive director. Then the second option as Enrique has outlined is should we, should we formalize our thoughts in some way either in, a, in, in using perhaps the, the instrument that's been used in the past um, or some version thereof um, and then finally, should we do actually a full assessment? You know, I, I liken it that she came on in this role really at the beginning of the year. And if we do advance her into the, you know, the executive director position, I think we could put our full evaluation process into the cadence of end of the year and keep that cadence going forward that uh, make sure to return to an annual assessment. It has to be public, but that that is the best practice for our executive directors and keep that going forward um, on, a, on an annual basis so that the executive director can expect, yep, it will have to be public, but I, um, I will be assessed and um, in, in my role on an annual basis. So, you know, we could do something more formal in September, it just won't be a full year. So I'm try my preference would be to go the full year for a more formal process, but something in between. I think Commissioner Zuniga and I 
debate, I don't know if we're really debating that or not, but uh, it really is the, the formal structure. But we have three, three options that we wanted to give you, and you may have a fourth or fifth too. Commissioner Cameron, I'm gonna to turn to you because I bet you've given this some thought. Well, I'm hearing the options certainly for the first time, but yes, I you know, certainly have thoughts about the, you know, the performance and the surveys and whatnot. But I, I think, I agree um, that we need to move this forward as quickly as possible um, for a number of reasons. Um, and I, I think if we did the informal uh, method now, knowing that it's almost September and we will get to the formal evaluation at the end of the year, that may be an appropriate way to, to move now that accomplishes the goals, um, but knowing that the end of the year is coming quickly. So to do a formal process now and do another one at the end of the year doesn't seem, um, it may be a step that we don't need to take at this time. Commissioner Stebbins, Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner Stebbins. Yeah, um, and, and, and I thank Commissioner Zuniga for kind of outlining some of our different options. Um, you know, obviously this is uh, a unique situation we found ourselves in. I think all of us uh, appreciate the great job that Karen has done. Uh, not only unique to step in on an interim basis, but obviously confronted with everything that has been thrown at us this year. Um, you know, hearing these suggestions for the first time, I'd, I'd love to find the opportunity in short order for us to have uh, a good discussion as a group. Uh, and obviously that would be in the, in the venue of a public hearing to, uh, to talk with Karen, uh, to talk about, you know, what, ideas she's had as she has settled into this role now twice uh, is, is uh, you know, what goals uh, she would have going forward as the, as the permanent executive director. Have that dialogue with the five of us to each of us be able to convey our concerns um, and, and wrap that up pretty quickly with, with the designation or a, uh, an appointment uh, in short order. Um, I think, Madam Chair, to your point, I would like us to get back on this regular cadence of an evaluation, uh, even if we did it for a short window um, through the end of the year. Um, you know, I know there's probably a lot that uh, Interim Director Wells has on her plate that she would like to knock off before the end of the year. I think that'd be a good evaluative step for us mm -hmm. to take on her success, as well as having given her some expectations through that initial conversation with the five of us as to you know what our our goals and our hope and direction for her work would be i think that would be fair um but i think to your point it would put us back on that regular cadence of kind of an annual evaluation so um somewhat i guess of a, a combination of some of the options that Com commissioner zuniga laid out um yeah. a formal interview which we have done with every other executive director that we've invited to fill the position. It was public, it was in front of us, it gave each commissioner an opportunity to talk about their priorities, hear from the candidate, um, just so we don't lose that kind of tradition if we ever in fact needed it again. And then uh, a kind of a quick end of the year evaluative process, maybe on the last three or four months when she officially has the position. Uh, to look at her work and again, as you said, get in that cadence of doing it every year from here on out. Commissioner O'Brien, thank you, Commissioner Stebbins. Uh, I, mean, I echo what everyone has said in terms of I do think it's time to move and clearly the form of how that has to happen in terms of an open meeting and a discussion, et cetera, is obviously um, mandated and appropriate. I think we should do that as soon as possible. I hate to throw another option out there to sort of have more okay. choice, but while I can appreciate wanting that cadence that's historically been there at the end of the year, given the timing of this, given the COVID timing of this, given the vacancies that we have, I'm not so sure another assessment three, three and a half months after we have vetted her and, and said, yes, okay, go ahead with your plan is going to be particularly fruitful. And it may add some level of um, freneticness to her trying to fill positions and things like that. So it could be that the off cycle is from the appointment and that you go six months out from that 
to do a six month assessment at that point with the idea. And then maybe there's another one three, four months out from there. And then you get on a cadence um, if it has to be December because that's by default how we've done it. But um, my concern with doing one that quickly after sort of a vetting and interview and a plan is particularly in the COVID remote environment we're in and some of the openings we have. Um, I don't know how, I, I'm, I'm worried that that might, some of the downside to that might outweigh, outweigh the benefits in terms of timing for just a couple of months difference. I guess I view it a little bit differently um, because uh, in terms of the options, I think Commissioner Sunaga was saying that we could really assess her and her interim set status now in a more formal fashion, and that could give guidance for her going forward. I thought it might make sense to actually combine her interim and then the four months that Commissioner Stebbins focused on and give a um, give an evaluation based on the context of where we are. Uh, you know, the, the next year may, may bring a completely different set of facts that we don't anticipate, just like, you know, 2018 and 2019 brought a different set of facts that you didn't anticipate. So the context um, of her assessment, I don't know if that needs to bind us um, because I think everyone has to be assessed in the context of which they find themselves working. So, um, you know, we, what I'm hearing is that there's, you know, some new choices that I hadn't thought about the, just the four month based on her position as executive director. I was imagining perhaps the, the interview process being informal, giving guidance, then taking really what we had, uh, the benefit of these last eight months and then combining it with the four months and then doing a real formal, the more formal assessment based on the entire year um, and, and acknowledge that, of course, it was an interim status. Um, and, and, and rather than doing it so formally in September, that then what do we do with the, the four, four months? There's no magic to the year end, except that um, <clears throat> she really will have been in this acting position as well as in her current director position of the IEB for um, eight months and then and then um, by the end of the year and I, I sort of feel we we owe somewhat of a formal formal review to ourselves and and to Karen and to the entire team and the public. So that was my thinking, almost a combination of the two. Misha Zunica, I know I, you know we've gone back and forth on this. Where are yeah, you? Yeah, no, now? no, I I I think that's 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 fair and I'm 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 in uh, I'm in agreement. I um let me just mention that um, if I hear a theme where everybody there, there's there's real real agreement is desire to move um, to move on this you know yes she's been in an interim position for far far longer than than, than anybody I think expected so um, yeah and, and then the question then really in that context becomes one of a vehicle what is the best vehicle to to elicit that conversation and in my mind is whether we try to do put together something in writing whether it's uh, a, a formal evaluation or a less formal one and he's forwarded to 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 karen for us to then discuss at a public meeting or um, if it's more um informal which was my option number one in which we just come in to have a conversation with the benefit of having had and her as well the survey that i think was also very important the, the two surveys uh, by the way, I, 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 I don't know if I noted, but we would then, prior to that conversation, whatever it is, uh, with something in writing or not, those, the results of those surveys would be forwarded to Karen. She has yeah. not received them yet. Um, but again, there's no surprise that there, 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 there's great feedback, uh, and she's well respected. And I'm not um, um, you know, discovering anything new, but uh, there's, there's also a, a big acknowledgement of how unique and difficult the situation is currently by operating in this uh, environment. So context will also, it has also been already taken into account by everybody. Per, perhaps um, if we don't want to resolve this right now, and maybe we do, I'm going to certainly give that as an option. Um, we could use um, Derek and, and the HR team to present these options to you um, 
in in a, a proper uh, arrangement so that you know you could get comfortable. I just I want to make sure we can be, and I'm, I am certain we can be nimble, but we don't want to have the process so um, <clears throat> further process create uh, further delay around the vehicle that you know Enrique just mentioned. We're just struggling a little bit about you know how um, we evaluate. Um, which probably means that we, we probably need to formalize that so that we don't struggle with it and that it does get done. And, and that can be accomplished through a written policy and procedure that will inform the, uh, um, the evaluation process going forward. You know, if it's in fact should be annual, then we'll stick to it and we'll make sure it gets done annually. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that we're struggling. I think we just oh, hurt each other. Uh, no, I know, one, struggling was just like, you know, I'm yeah, not sure. No, and I, for one, would love to make this decision now and move Good. forward, if, if it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, struggling might have been a suggestion that just, you know, we're... Yeah, I mean, I think we just needed to hear each other, which we yeah. did, and it's... If we can. So I was going to certainly yes. return back if we, if we um, can come up with... I would like it to be a solid consensus, you know, um, rather than a divided vote, if possible, because it's such an important part of our, our responsibilities. Um, Commissioner uh, uh, Cameron, Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner Stebbins, do you have a suggested, or if you want well, to? Well, I'm not. I'm not exactly clear what everybody is. I, I think we're in many ways saying the same thing, but with just a little difference in exactly. timing, maybe. But mm -hmm. um, again, I, I get back to I like the idea of. Uh, uh, having kind of an informal uh, conversation at this point with surveys to discuss and then, um, you know, certainly before we know it, the end of the year will be here, which will be a more formal process. Yeah, Based I, I on would... the entire year, based on yes. both their interim Correct. Process. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Stebbins? Yeah, I, I would like to see us move, you know, quickly, even, you know, I know we're going to share the the results of the two surveys that were done uh i would like to see that done as quickly as we can so maybe I, that our first meeting in september uh we're having this open conversation we all agree that she's done a great job and we want to offer her the position so we can kind of check that off as early as we can um you know the evaluative process um you know when when we named her interim it was really to make sure that you know the trains and trucks kept running on time um i think we'd all agree that she has done that um but obviously obviously giving her the permanent position letting her lay out some of her goals and something that we can measure them by uh really over the remaining months of the year is important uh, as well as just kind of folding into more of a general evaluation and recognition of her work uh, through the first almost three quarters of the year, I think is uh, helpful. Um, again, I hate to evaluate somebody when really we didn't set out goals or expectations for them. Um, I think that's tough. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'd love to see our next meeting in September, uh, an interview, give her time to digest the survey results uh, and have some feedback to whatever presentation she would like to make to us and, and, and really just kind of get that get that step done with and then you know the evaluator piece we can kind of work on over the uh the coming months with an so eye towards is, looking uh, back as well as looking ahead and maybe getting on a cadence that's a good differentiator so that at the very least we um we can say maybe we're going with option one that commissioner Zuniga first presented and not worrying about having any kind of an evaluated piece ready for the the first meeting in september and then um, the vehicle that we use for assessment, it will need to be prepared anyway, but I don't want it to linger. My goal would be by year end that there would be some kind of a formal process. And, and, and to um, Commissioner O'Brien's point, if it becomes clear that that assessment is difficult to do given where we were, we'll, 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 we'll um, react okay. to that um, when, when we start preparing the, the the uh, the evaluative document does that make sense, Eileen? 
Yeah, I think that's accurate. I think the way Bruce summarized it and then your description of sort of if, if there needs to be an audible based on an on the ground assessment, given the circumstances, then I think we need to be open to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We've had to have a few audibles, haven't we? Yeah. So. <laughs> I know. And that, that word steady state, I came on and you've used it and I do not understand what that means. So. <laughs> it's coming one day. You know, we're all, all, all the team has acted in a very steady way, um, regardless of what the context is. And that's been my experience. So congratulations to the um, entire team and it's all its efforts during this time. Um, we kid about it, but it's, it, it does not ever, uh, it really continues to amaze me. And also just to go back, I thank all the members of the team that did participate in the survey. We, we did get a very good um, outcome and participation. So that was, it made it meaningful. And that also says a lot about uh, how they view the, the need for, for leadership and how they view Karen. And we appreciate that. Uh, even the open questions were all very inspired. So thank you so much. So I think then, um, I don't think we have to take any formal uh, vote today. I think we'll proceed with, um, I, I have the email ready to send uh, to Karen with the, uh, the survey. So she'll get that, have some time to think. And we'll, our plan will be, unless there's, um, you know, barring something that develops, uh, that it will come in the first uh, full public commission meeting in September, which I think if um, Mary Ann were on is September 10th, perhaps. So, um, and I think that right now in, through our agenda setting process, that looks like a good date for this. So thank you. Um, now we do have an extensive afternoon plan uh, because we have a number of executive sessions, mainly on litigation updates, uh, really important, but it, it involves some outside um, uh, counselors and uh, guidance. Todd, we are running about a good half hour later than we anticipated. Can you get in touch with um, the attorneys who are joining us today for the executive session and let them know that we need to start at a later, um, a later time? It is right now, I'm going to round up 110. Um, I know that we need, <laughs> Commissioner Cameron's like, round up to 115, Kathy. <laughs> um, I think that um, um, before we actually move formally on that, I just wanted to make sure we thought about the logistics. How much time should we bring it all the way to two or should we uh, shoot for 145? Uh, Commissioner Zuniga, what are you thinking? I think 145. Oh. Uh, Commissioner Zuniga was she thinking too. I said she two o'clock. She beat me to the two o'clock. I, um, yeah. I, I, I think we might all works. have, I think we might all have some work to do too. And so that's a really loud phone. Um, it's a landline just a second. We're in a little bit of a different space than you expect that. Uh, why don't we Why don't we go to two? Um, I forgive I forgive um, forgive us, but it's not involving the public, and I am hopeful that the um, the executive sessions will move along in an efficient way. Uh, but in order to go into an executive session, um, General Counsel Grossman, if you could help us out. Um, do Ma I Madam have... Chair, Madam yeah. Chair, just one real quick before we. Adjourned for, um, with the executive session. Oh, yes, yeah, so on the uh, commissioner update. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I did just want to point out that while we've been meeting, uh, there's been great news on the other side of the state out in Springfield. Uh, the governor, um, Congressman Neal, uh, MGM, the folks from WIN Development, W I N N, uh, development in Opal Development uh, got together for an announcement that the uh, funding pieces are all now in place and were publicly announced to move ahead with the renovation and development of 31 Elm Street. So, um, great news. I know, I, really I know it was a long way to get there, but uh, yeah. kudos to all of those folks and leaders for, for getting it done and making it possible. And it really was, it, it, it was very innovative and creative and it took a, a lot of, uh, a lot of folks to get there, uh, but what an exciting announcement, Bruce. Thank you. Um, excellent news. 
And any other I should have asked, Commissioner, uh, do you have any update? No, okay, but uh, Commissioner Stebbins, thank you for that. Now, um, uh, General Counsel Grossman, I wanna get this right. We hadn't had a chance to speak about this yesterday, but I believe I have to actually um, read into the record each um, executive session and the purpose of why we would go in. And then there needs to be a roll call vote for each executive session, correct? That's exactly right. And we also want to uh, make a declaration as to whether the uh, public session will reconvene at the council. That's right. And so all of right. this information is right on the agenda. Right, public, so the uh, public review. does have notice of this through the agenda, but I will go through the process. Um, we do have five executive sessions planned. It, it was uh, to create an efficiency with the use of outside council. So thank you, and it also all timely, so thank you. Uh, the, uh, the commission is anticipated today to meet an executive session in accordance with GL 30A, section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining at discussion at an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the, of the commission. The public session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of the executive session. I will need to take a roll call vote. Uh, I guess we need a motion. And I think so moved. Before. So moved. I have a second. <laughs> second. Was that okay to say, uh, General Counsel Grossman? I think that'll be okay on appeal, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> um, we'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner uh, Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Okay, moving on to the next item. The commission is anticipated to meet in executive session in accordance with GL chapter 30A, section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to a matter related to Wynn versus Wells, MGC, Wynn Resorts, as discussion at an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the commission. The public session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of this executive session. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you. Roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zudenka. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Thank you. Moving on to the next item. The commission is anticipated to meet an executive session in accordance with GL chapter 30A. Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to FBT, Everett Realty, LLC versus MGC versus WinMass LLC as discussion at an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the, on the litigating position of the commission. The public session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of the executive session. Do I have a, um, a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, thank you. Roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Sunica. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. You know what? I'm not sure if I've been saying my own vote each time. Um, for the record, yes, yes, and now yes. So five zero on all three of the above. Uh, the commission is anticipated to meet in executive session in accordance with. GL Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to a matter related to FBT, Effort Realty, LLC versus MGC versus Win Mass, um, MA, I'm sorry, LLC. As discussion at an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the commission. The public session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of this executive session. Do I have a motion? So moved. so moved. Second. Thank you. Roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, 5 0. Um, the commission is anticipated to meet an executive session in accordance with GL Chapter 38, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to City of Revere and Mohegan Sun. Massachusetts LLC versus the Massachusetts Gaming Commission, as discussion at an open meeting may be detrimental to the litigating in, um, position of the commission. 
public session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of this executive session. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you. Roll call vote, Commis uh, Commissioner uh, Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, five zero. So for all, all five items we um, will be going into executive session as explained and approved by 5-0 vote of all of us. Thank you. At this time, I will need a motion to um, adjourn our public meeting and then we anticipate going into our executive session through a, a separate HD meeting connection and that will st um, start at 2 p.m. So oh, Commissioner Stebbins has moved to adjourn. Commissioner Cameron? Second. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. And I vote yes, 5-0. And thank you to all for um, your, your uh, good work today. I appreciate it. And to all those that have attended and we've had a good, strong presence, thank you so much for all the M MGC team for participating in today's meeting. Thank you, uh, General Counsel Grossman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll see you too. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone.